בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, ברוכים הבאים. We're back up, ברוך השם, and our Wednesday night, סתם את הרבי, we're after some דברי תורה that are relevant to the parasha, to the times. Uh, then uh, you guys will start asking some questions, and בעזרת השם הקדוש ברוך הוא will give us the answers. Tonight's show is going to be for the רפואה שלמה for רב אפרים בן שולמית, רבנית שרה בת ענת, רבנית לבנה בת שרה, אבי מורי דוד בן נסריה, אמי מורתי דוריס בת ז'ורה, and all of Am Yisrael and all the righteous Noahites that continue to watch our shiurim, to continue to learn, to get closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and sanctify His name. Anyone that wants to uh, join us and help poor people here in this uh, campaign that we have right now for Purim, We have, Baruch Hashem, uh, quite a bit uh, planned for this uh, Purim. We have a, uh, a big uh, learning session that's going to actually happen in uh, Yerushalayim, uh, as well as other places uh, on, uh, on Purim, to uh, continue learning, but also to give everybody an opportunity to, uh, to get some extra help financially on uh, Purim uh, in Eretz Yisrael. So anyone that wants to help us uh, by using their machatzit uh, shekel and their... Uh, um, Matanot Lev Yunim, the uh, two out of the four mitzvot that we're obligated to do on uh, Purim, uh, much more important than the costumes and even more important than the Mishloach Banot. Uh, these two uh, mitzvot, the Machatzit Shekel and uh, the uh, Matanot Lev Yunim, are an uh, obligation that, uh, you know, especially the Matanot Lev Yunim. So if you want to help us, you can donate on bhpurim.org. bhpurim.org, that's B as in Be'ezat, H as in Hashem. Purim is P-U-R-I-M dot org. Uh, and uh, just like every year, we have a uh, campaign there to help the poor in Eretz Yisrael, uh, especially the uh, poor Torah scholars, or, uh, religious families, but of course we also help the non-religious families. Uh, anyone that comes to help, we do our best to help them, Baruch Hashem, throughout the entire year, but especially at these times. So if you want uh, to join us, that's the place to uh, donate. Uh, also, we, uh, I know that quite a few of you are uh, going to be using the uh, new book that we've been distributing over the last several months that's both in English and in Hebrew. Uh, and you're going to use it for your Mishloach Manot. So, Baruch uh, Hashem, we're uh, waiting for our next uh, two uh, shipments to come in, hopefully in the next uh, day or two. Uh, and if you're going to use this for your Mishloch Manot, uh, in so many words, anyone that orders uh, on the Kiruv store uh, between now and probably no later than Sunday afternoon, there's a good chance you're going to get the package uh, before Purim. So you can add it to your Mishloch Manot and uh, distribute it to as uh, many people as you want. If you need more than 20 copies, then uh, you could uh, order 20 on the website uh, and then uh, uh, send me a message and I'll try to get you more copies than 20. Each box comes with 20. Uh, so uh, this is, uh, Baruch Hashem, uh, is uh, going out very fast and uh, Baruch Hashem, people are enjoying it. Uh, there's already a couple of schools uh, that uh, are uh, interested in using this as part of their curriculum, Baruch Hashem. So... Uh, like I said, if anyone that wants to order it, you can go to the Kiruv store. The Kiruv store is K-I-R-U-V-S-T-O-R-E dot org. And you can order a box of 20 for free. We even pay for the shipping. Of course, if you want to help us with this monumental cost of distributing books and USBs and a bunch of other things for free uh, in the lectures... Uh, then, of course, you could donate on that website. You could donate on the regular website, bezadashem.org. You could donate on uh, the app. You could uh, wire transfer a million dollars if you'd like. You could do a lot of different things. In so many words, if you want to help, uh, you have the ability to do so. If you don't want to help or you simply can't help with money, you could certainly help with other things like your time, skills, and uh, volunteering, and doing a lot of other things. But with that being said, we have to get to the shiur, since we haven't done a shiur this week uh, with you guys. Uh, of course, Bo Hashem, we continue learning, we continue teaching, but not always online. Uh, but uh, needless to say, uh, we need to learn. We need to learn. This is the Torah, and we need to learn it. But what are we going to learn from a parasha? That once again, parashat Pekudei, the last parasha in Sefer Shmot, the book of Exodus, Again, talks about the Mishkan. We've talked about the Mishkan already for the last several weeks. 
the menorah, the Arun HaKodesh, the Machatzit uh, shekel, all of the different things that had to do with the Mishkan. We've talked and talked and talked about it. And again, we're talking about it. But of course, the Torah is endless. Afochba ve'afochba dekulaba. Delve into it and delve into it because everything is in it. Literally everything. Not figuratively everything. Everything, everything. And the more you learn Torah, the more you will find the world you live in, including your personal life in it. Even questions that some people like to uh, waste a lot of time on, like is the world, world round or flat, which somebody asked, perhaps maybe we'll answer it later today because a few people have asked this question and uh, we've answered it, but maybe we'll give them some more details uh, that uh, we could uh, help people with. But if you remind me, maybe we'll do it. Be'ezrat Hashem. Either way, the Parashat Pikudeh has an enormous amount of Torah in it, but most of it, if you look at it, is something that you can learn from and enjoy the learning, learn a lot of different things, but you can't really, it seems like you can't apply it to your life, so you'll get the reward for just simply learning. Unless you pay attention to the details, which of course, there is Musar to learn everywhere. And one of the first things that we learn in the beginning of the parasha, the Midrash says that Betzalel ben Uri ben Chul emate Yehuda asa et kol asher tziva Adonai et Moshe. Betzalel, the son of Uri, son of Chul, of the tribe of Yehuda, did everything that Hashem commanded Moshe. What do you mean commanded Moshe? You mean that everything that Moshe commanded you? No. Everything that Hashem commanded Moshe, meaning that Bezalel got Ruach HaKodesh, Ruach HaKodesh, to not only do everything that Moshe told him, but also everything that Moshe forgot to tell him. But Hashem told Moshe to such an extent that when Moshe Rabbeinu saw the work that Bezalel did, and he knew that he forgot to tell him about it, he's like, wait, but so how did you do this one? And now I didn't tell you how to do it. Were you listening in on my conversation between me and Hashem? That's how much Ruach HaKodesh, HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave Betzalel. Now, of course, a tzaddik like Moshe has to have tzaddikim around him. But one of the extraordinary examples of the righteousness of Moshe Rabenu is actually presented in this parasha. In this parasha that seems like it's repeating the same thing, it actually has a new Musar lessons for us to apply and really get ourselves into a better position in life because a person could be aware of the truth, know the truth, watch the truth with us and learn the truth with us already for the last 10 plus years but still live a lie. Still live a lie. A person can know the truth, but live a lie. Why? Because knowledge is not necessarily something that's going to always motivate a person enough to take action. Where a person can know the truth, but still live a lie. And in fact, this is the reason why Rav Kanievsky writes in his sefer called Orchot Yoshel that the hardest trait, character trait to master is emet, living the truth. Knowing the truth is not that difficult. Why? The truth is available to us. All you need to know is where it is, which is in the Torah. Then delve into it and delve into it and you will be enamored by it. But in order for you to be able to apply this truth to your life, first and foremost, a person has to have fear of heaven, meaning they need to know that there's a consequence for knowing the truth. There's even a bigger consequence for ignoring the truth. Now, aside from that, a person has to humble themselves in order to be able to apply more of the truth to their life. Because even if one knows the truth, in order to live the truth, they have to humble themselves by acknowledging the fact that knowing is not enough. And in fact, the fact that 
I know the truth obligates me even more. And even though I disagree with the truth, that just puts me in the wrong position because the truth doesn't change. The truth is not subjective. The, the, the truth is not based on your perspective. The truth is the truth whether you acknowledge it or not. And when we tell people the truth, sometimes they take it to heart and apply it, but unfortunately many times they just have a limit. They accept, they accept, they accept. Yes, keep Shabbat. Yes, start mishpacha. Yes, uh, you know, make a few donations. Yes, uh, you know, learn Torah. But if you said that, oh, that's where their line is. That's where their line is. And unfortunately, Rabotai, that red line where a person knows the truth but ignores it is the beginning of living a lie. Now, Living a lie seems like, okay, you know what? He's living a lie. She's living a lie. Uh, maybe one day they'll change. You're right. Maybe one day they'll change. But what they're not acknowledging is the price of the lie could be much more expensive than you can imagine. And that's some of the things we're going to delve in tonight. Moshe Rabbeinu is Kodesh Kodeshim. Isha Elohim. He's holy of holies, the man of God. No prophet has ever been or will ever be like Moshe Rabbeinu, including the Mashiach. Even the Mashiach will not be as great as Moshe Rabbeinu. Nobody will ever be as great as Moshe Rabbeinu. Why? Moshe Rabbeinu is excluded from everyone else. He's an exception. And this is also one of the things that the Torah says, which is one of the greatest proofs, as it's one of the 13 principles of Jewish faith, to believe that Moshe Rabbeinu is the greatest of all prophets because once you know that, that means that every other religion, every other ideology, every other belief that does not have Moshe Rabbeinu as number one is simply false. So this Moshe Rabbeinu, as great as he is, took Am Yisrael out of Egypt. Ten miracles in Egypt of the plagues. Countless other miracles within the plagues. Hundreds of plagues. 250 more plagues in the Sea of Reeds. As the Agadah tells us. In the name of Rabbi Akiva. Endless amount of miracles. Moshe Rabbeinu shows us the words of God. Not just tells us. When Moshe speaks. The voice of God comes out of his voice. Not that Moshe Rabbeinu is God, chas v'shalom. But HaKadosh Baruch Hu decided to give Moshe Rabbeinu extraordinary abilities, unlike any other. Moshe Rabbeinu's face was shining like the sun to the point where he wore a mask at all times except when he taught people Torah. When the people first saw Moshe Rabbeinu's face, he didn't realize that his face was so shining. When he came down from Mount Sinai, the people were scared. They thought that just looking at him would cause them to die. Moshe Rabbeinu's humility was unlike any other, as the Kadosh Baruch Hu himself vouches for him that he's the humblest of all people. Even if you find a poor, homeless person full of diseases, full of trials and tribulations, and you compare their humility to Moshe Rabbeinu, there would not be a comparison because Moshe Rabbeinu would be a lot more humble than him. The same token, if you compare him to the most successful person, but the most decent human being, their humility will be nothing in comparison to Moshe Rabbeinu. But at the same time, Moshe Rabbeinu was extraordinarily capable. He was extraordinarily powerful, more powerful than the rest of Am Yisrael combined, as we'll, we see in this week's parasha, where after they built the entire Mishkan, they all try to pick it up. They can't. The entire people try. 600,000 people are trying to pick up the Mishkan. HaKadosh Baruch Hu doesn't let it happen. They can't pick up the pieces. They come to Moshe Rabbeinu and say, Moshe, we, I don't know what, we don't know what we did wrong. Apparently, God doesn't like the Mishkan because we did everything you said. But the Mishkan won't go up. 
Moshe Rabbeinu speaks to Hashem, Hashem laughs and he says to him, of course it's not going to go up. It has to have your hand on it. You alone can pick up the Mishkan. Moshe Rabbeinu goes and picks up the Mishkan by himself. Moshe says to Hashem, how can I pick up the Mishkan? I can't even get my hands around a couple of the poles at the same time. Hashem says, don't worry. You just go, make the effort. I'll do the rest. Why? Your Moshe Rabbeinu is married to the Shekhinah. So this Moshe Rabbeinu, this Isha Elohim, this extraordinary person, does anybody need to speak a good word about him to, to vouch for him? No. The Torah itself vouches for him. But yet this very same Moshe Rabbeinu in the parasha does an accounting where the Torah says that Moshe Rabbeinu calculates every single penny that was donated. All of the silver, all of the gold, all of the copper, all of the items were calculated in front of everybody so everyone knows exactly how much was donated so no one thinks that Moshe Rabbeinu would steal no Moshe Rabbeinu first of all he doesn't need to steal he's already extraordinarily wealthy second of all why would he steal what benefit would he have third of all why does anybody else need Moshe Rabbeinu to count everything in front of them? Isn't it enough to just tell them, listen, by the way, we got you know, several thousand tons of gold, several thousand tons of, uh, of silver, several... Can't he just give them the number? Isn't that enough? Moshe Rabbeinu says no. Why? Moshe Rabbeinu is teaching us one of the mitzvot of the Torah, be clean in the eyes of Hashem as well as in the eyes of man. Where there's a mitzvah, the Torah says, of Marita Ein, where a person has a responsibility, an obligation to not only be clean in the eyes of God, where obviously God knows everything that you do, everything that you think, everything that you feel, He knows everything. Your actions on the exterior have to match the interior. You can't pretend to be honest, but in reality you're a liar. You're honest only because it's going to help you get your way. You have to be the same inside and outside. Hashem knows what's inside. Hashem knows what's outside. But that's not enough. Some people just focus on their relationship with Hashem and say, listen, as long as I don't, you know, violate Shabbat, I don't eat not kosher, I don't kill nobody. Apparently, everybody's always making it a special statement of accomplishment when they don't kill people. Like apparently it's become an accomplishment, an achievement if you're not a murderer. I don't kill anybody. I don't steal from anybody. You don't kill anybody, most likely I believe you. You don't steal? Ah, eh. Hard to believe. Why? Gemara itself says, most people get caught on stealing. Meaning in Shemaim, a Kadosh Baruch Hu sees them stealing. No, 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 I don't steal, I'm honest. I, oh, I didn't say that you go rob banks. But stealing is not necessarily only robbing banks. Stealing comes in all forms of sizes. And stealing requires a person to simply not pay attention to details or even more so to get used to a certain lie to the point where that lie becomes truth. It's a convenient lie. It's a lie that, you know, they call all types of lies. And unfortunately, Rabotai Yekarim, this is one of the things that most people fail at. When it comes to truth, knowing the truth is easy. Living the truth is hard. Moshe Rabbeinu wanted to make sure that everyone knows that he's not only knowledgeable of the truth, but he lives the truth. But in case anybody would have any questions, any doubts, any accusations, Moshe Rabbeinu wanted to make sure 
everyone knows exactly how much money was donated to the Bet Amigdash, to the Mishkan. Now, interestingly enough, Tomit Chacham by the name of Rabbi Deutsch brings a few Midrashim, Chazal, that actually say that silver was more expensive, more valuable than gold at the time of Mount Sinai. Now, of course, all of the silver uh, conspiracy theorists can make a whole uh, party over this statement. Ah, you see, we've always told you that silver should be a lot more expensive. It's not right that it's only $25 an ounce when gold is a 2100 We see, I always told you it's going to go to 1000 now. Look at it. Take it easy. Yes, there are some truth in the argument that silver is much more useful than gold is. Part of the reason is because it's much cheaper but the reality is that in the Torah we see that silver is used very often but, and actually is considered more valuable than gold, but yet gold has more blessing. Why does gold have more blessing? Why did gold overcome silver in price over the last 3,000 years? Of course, this is from the Torah. On one end, we're saying that silver was more valuable. The price of silver was 2,000 and gold was 25. But things switched. Why did things switch? What's the switch all about? If you look at the donations, we have two types of donations to the Mishkan. Am Yisrael used silver to give the machatzita shekel, the half a shekel. So this helped Am Yisrael pay for a bunch of different things, after, but also to do the census. But the amount of silver, quantity of silver, was less than the quantity of gold. There was much more gold given by Am Yisrael for the Mishkan. Where silver, it was an obligation to give it. Because that was what they used as a coin to do the census. Based on the current price of silver being $25 today, Am Yisrael donated about $3.75 million as part of the census. This is 600,000 people giving a half a shekel. On the other hand, the donations from the heart, meaning whatever you felt, you want to give a lot, you don't want to give a lot, you want to just give enough to do the machatita shekel on the Bezat Hashem campaign for $12 and you want to fulfill your Matanot Lev Yunim with just $50, fulfill the minimum, or maybe you even found some holiness person that can live off of less than $50 somehow. No problem. You want to do the minimum? Go ahead. Be my guest. Do the minimum. But then there are some people that say, no, no, why, why should I do the minimum? I don't want Hashem to give me the minimum. I don't want Hashem to give me the minimum amount of air, the minimum amount of food, the minimum amount of of money, the minimum amount of things that I need to live, I want Hashem to be generous with me. If you want Hashem to be generous with you, you have to be also generous with the Torah, with the creation. The more generous you are, the more HaKadosh Baruch Hu will bless you. But generosity, obviously, to the right places. So in this particular case, when you see that you have a lot more than what you need, this obligates you to be generous because the reason why Hashem gave you more is so you could be generous. So Am Yisrael was much more generous with gold because that was what they used for the tzedakah for the, in essence, donation from the heart. And this was 
value of almost 95 million dollars 95 million dollars now as far as the the um reason before this at this time the value of silver is higher than gold so don't mistake or misunderstand what i'm saying to you that the value of gold was 95 million back then versus 4 million or 3.7 million back then um and that's what amisrael gave no the value of the silver was higher they gave 300,000 selas versus the uh, 87,000 selas of the uh, gold. So they let, give less quantity of gold. But they knew they needed gold and specifically to, to do a tikkun of the golden calf. But this was an ongoing thing. This is something that didn't stop here. This is something that they would constantly do over time. And people were much more generous with gold ultimately giving gold more of a blessing to the point where HaKadosh Baruch Hu made it so that there is several different types of gold in the creation and gold became much more valuable metal. Now, either way, the most important part of everything we just said is the fact that Moshe Rabbeinu takes the initiative and actually calculates the exact number of gold, the exact number of silver, copper, and everything else in order to make sure that nobody questions him, nobody thinks that he's lying or he's cheating or anything else. Now, this is one of the most important traits that a person can learn from not just in this week's parasha, but in general in life. And the reason why is because although, to be honest, is not necessarily always easy, it does come with extraordinary rewards at the end. Whereas to be a liar, even a small liar, ultimately has a downside much greater than the benefit of the lies. Now, Moshe Rabbeinu shows us the four keys to success. That if a person wants to succeed in life, whether it's in business or, or, or any type of thing that they're building, they obviously have, have four keys. One, have Hashem as number one. If Hashem is your guiding light, He's your giving your... Every decision is dependent on whether you're afraid of Hashem or you're not afraid of Hashem, whether you believe in Hashem, you don't believe in Hashem, you trust in Hashem, you don't trust in Hashem. If you have that, you already have a check mark next to one. Now, a person can say, no, I love God, but be an idol worshiper. There are plenty of people that say they love God, but they think God is a person, or they think God is money, they think God is, is it's the wrong address. That's where having the sages, represented by Moshe Rabbeinu, also has to be number two. If a person does not have a rabbi, that they listen to everything that they say, that they tell the rabbi everything that's going on in their life, all the big decisions, the small decisions, and they just simply do things, whatever makes sense to them, then unfortunately, they only have partial truth. They may believe in God, they may trust in God, but they don't trust in God's system. They don't believe in God's system. God gave us a system. What is that system? The system is to have not just Moshe, our rabbi, but all of those that learn from Moshe in every single generation that's represented by the Torah scholars of the day. If a person appreciates Torah scholars from afar, but near, he doesn't have a rabbi. He doesn't have any rabbi that he tells everything. He doesn't have anyone that is able to rebuke him or her. No, he just does whatever he wants to do and he figures that if he needs anything, he'll make a few calls. This time he'll call Rabbi A. Next time he'll call Rabbi B. If he likes their answers, he'll continue using them. If he doesn't like their answers, he'll use somebody else. 
That's a, unfortunately a partial truth. That's a person that may believe in God, may observe Shabbat, may eat kosher, she may be modest, but she doesn't believe in God's system of listening to the rabbis no different than the way you would listen to God. And that's what the Gemara says. If somebody actually has a rabbi, they fear that rabbi the same way that they fear God. Now, if this rings a bell in your mind in a negative way, where you're starting to think, nah, come on, this, that means you don't believe in God's system. That means you don't believe in God's system. Now, what does it mean to listen to the rabbis? It means listen to the rabbis, literally, as it is. Your rabbi says A, you do A. Your rabbi says B, you do B. Even if you don't want to, even if you don't agree, even if you don't like. Why? Because if you have a rabbi, that means the rabbi wants your best interest. If you don't believe that the rabbi has your best interest in in mind, then why is he your rabbi? Now, if you say, well, I haven't found the rabbi that has my best interest in mind, then that is a a lie, a, a sack of lies that you can sell somebody else. Why? If you actually make the effort, certainly you can find a rabbi that's a Torah scholar, that knows Torah, that can guide you and over time get to know you more and more. But the problem is that people will make a lot more investment into their own friendships with people, their own uh, uh, asset building, their house, their jewelry, their vacations, their job, their careers, their uh, hobbies, than they'll make for, on their rabbinical relationships. So many times people say, I don't have a rabbi, and it's not because no rabbi is willing to help them, but rather because they're not willing to invest in it. Or they're one of these people, that, like we talked about, I think it was last week or a week before, where they're just, they're like a leech, where they only want to take, 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 but they don't want to give anything. What is it like? Arami Ponovich was an extraordinary chacham, could have easily been the gdolado had he not spent all of his energy on building Yeshivat Ponovich. And he would put aside his Torah, his learning, his life, in order to travel from place to place to go collect more money so the young boys can continue to learn Torah and become big Torah scholars, big giants. He sacrificed his own Torah in order to build the next generation of Torah giants, of Torah scholars, of people that dedicate their life to Torah, big and small. One time when he was speaking to a millionaire, asking him to donate to the yeshiva, where he needed literally millions of dollars each month just to continue running the yeshiva, the kola, and everything that they have. The millionaire told him, Rabbi, I worked very hard to make uh, these, uh, all this money. I made a lot of sacrifices to make this money. What, why should I give it to you? What sacrifices did you make? Rami Ponovich smiled at him and says, I made much bigger sacrifices than you can ever make. I sacrificed my entire Torah. Already as a young man, they told me that I was going to take the place in the next generation after the Chafetz Chaim. I was going to take the seat, the throne of the Chafetz Chaim. But I put all of that aside in order to build the Yeshiva. And anyway, each time the Rami Ponovich would travel to places, he was an extraordinary Magid. Gives lectures, shirim. And then after the shiur, tell people to donate for the yeshiva. One time he came to the States, came to the US, gave a shiur. And uh, at the end of the shiur, one young man, an American, came to him and started speaking some words that he knew in, in Hebrew because the rabbi didn't speak English. And the young man didn't speak much Hebrew. But he tried communicating to the rabbi and he said, Rabbi, I didn't understand everything you said in the shiur, in the lecture, but I do understand that you need money. Rami Ponovich smiled at him and says, you're the only one in this entire place that understood the point of the lecture. Sometimes a person 
can listen, 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 but never understand the point. Can do, 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 but never understand the point. Every year we read Megillah still, but rarely does anybody understand the point of the Megillah. You ask somebody, what's the point of the Megillah? Oh, to, uh, to recognize the miracles. What miracles? Oh, the miracle that Hashem saved us, the miracle that, well, Hashem saved us all the time. Well, the miracle that he killed Haman, well, there's many new Hamans that were born. Well, the, uh, you know, the, 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 the Megillah, yeah, I know the Megillah. What's the point of the whole thing? Well, to know the story of Am Yisrael going to eat with the Hashverosh and that party and it wasn't a good thing. Why? Why wasn't it a good thing? Why can't you just go to a restaurant and eat? Why can't you go to a Super Bowl party? Why can't you go and uh, have Thanksgiving like the Goim? Why? Why can't you do all this? No, because Hashem uh, didn't say, you know, said it, but he didn't say it. And you're confused. The whole point of Purim is to glorify God's name and show everyone that the most important thing is to honor Hashem and to make Hashem's honor superior to everything else. So much so that the Gemara in Masechet Megillah said, if you did not sanctify Hashem's name today, it was better off you weren't born. The Mishnah in Masechet Avot says, Akadosh Baruch Hu created everything for the honor of His name, for His glory, not your glory, not your name. When a person understands their obligation to honor God's name, they live their life differently. But when a person understands their obligation to, or their need to glorify their own name, they'll never understand the point of Judaism, they'll never understand the point of the holidays, they'll never understand the point of Torah. So Rabbi Ponovich told this young man, you understand the lecture better than everybody else. Why? What am I coming here? I'm bored. I have nothing to do. I came here to convince you guys to donate into Torah. But I can't just come and say donate. So I'm giving you a shield to educate you, to show, show you some of the fruits of what the Torah brings, things that you can benefit from, things that you can learn from, but even more so things that you can become a partner with. So many times a person that's a taker, that only takes, 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 they can have a shiul Torah every week, five times a week. They can have 500 questions being answered, but never understand that the whole point, the whole point is for them to become a partner in all of this. Partner in contribution of money, partner in contribution of time, partner in con contribution of, their, of, of everything of their life. So, when a person looks at the Torah in a way where they're looking at it as an intellectual endeavor rather than a life, a Torah life, then unfortunately they're not going to be able to live the truth. They may recognize the truth, or at least parts of it, but they'll never be able to live the truth. Because living the truth requires a person to make sacrifices. Some sacrifices a person will understand, some sacrifices a person will not understand. So the first thing that a person needs to recognize is that Hashem, it's not just giving honor to Hashem with words or writing some messages on the internet of how much you love Hashem, but rather making Hashem your number one investment of time, of money, of, of feelings. You should love no one Fear no one. Contribute to no one more than Hashem. Hashem has to be literally number one. Two, to know how to do all of this, a person must follow the lead of those that have done it, which are the Torah scholars throughout all of the generation up until today, all the way from Moshe Rabbeinu up until today. Three, Moshe Rabbeinu says the third pillar, the third pillar of the, of the four pillars of truth is the Levites. Who are the Levites? The Torah scholars. Not just your rabbi, but to be 
part of the Torah community to invest into other people learning and not just yourself. Making sure that a person is doing everything they can to magnify, to increase the amount of Torah being learned in the world. But the four, after a person has achieved the first three, four is the most difficult. And that is honesty. Moshe Rabbeinu says, I showed you the words of God. Moshe Rabbeinu says, Hashem chose me to be the representative. Moshe Rabbeinu says, the Levites are the ones that stood up for the truth when the golden calf sin was made, and they're the ones that killed the evil. But Moshe Rabbeinu says that despite all of what happened, despite my position, I still have to show you that I'm not just knowledgeable of the truth, representing the truth, aware of the truth, but I'm living the truth. And that's why I'm doing the accounting and showing you how much money came in so you know where it's going. If only organizations would do that, where they literally, people would know where their money is going, I bet you that 9 out of 10 people Nine out of ten people, if not even more, would decide to donate elsewhere. Because when they did studies on this, most of the time people donate for a cause, but never reach the cause. They donate to help some poor person in Africa, or in South America, or wherever it is, but in reality all it's doing is enriching somebody else in a different country. They donate food. To people, they end up empowering terrorism. So Moshe Rabbeinu wants us to know that honesty is critical. And no one is above approach. No one is not subject to this. Everyone has to know that honesty is critical. Now, why is honesty so difficult? Because in order to live honesty, that means that you have to apply it everywhere. Not just in your Torah learning, and not just in the mitzvahs that you've already accepted upon yourself, and you're comfortable with already at this point. But rather, other things. Now, if a person flinches every single time he hears some of the the sharp words of the sages, but in not in a positive way, but rather their immediate reaction is that this can't be true or they must mean something else. That means that there is a bigger impact of, uh, of the Yetzirah on you than there is of the Yetzirah Tov. Why? Because when you hear the truth, technically it's not necessarily always going to be so, uh, you know, so convenient and so comforting, but your immediate reaction should be, this is the truth. Not, no, it can't be. Are you sure? Doubting it. If your immediate reaction is doubting it, doubting the words of the sages, then usually there's an issue. There's an issue that could be hurting you in many other places. So for example, when the sages say that we have to make blessings on eating, drinking, after we relieve ourselves, a person that is comfortable with that mitzvah would not have a problem fulfilling it. And if they forgot to make a blessing, they, uh, okay, you know, it's not really a big deal. Not really a big deal according to them. In fact, if they hear some of the things that the sages say about blessings, they may think twice about how much of a good blesser they are. The Gemara says in Masechet Brachot that a person that enjoys anything in this world without blessing Hashem is a thief. They're enjoying something that Hashem gave them without saying thank you, without blessing Hashem. What does this mean, blessing Hashem? When Hashem needs you to bless Him? 
הרב יצחק יוסף, ירקות יוסף, clarifies this point for all of the heretics that unfortunately are upon us in the name of the sages and tells us that blessing Hashem is not chas v'shalom it's benefiting Hashem but rather he brings Rabbeinu Bechaye commentary on Sefer Dvarim where he says that although Hashem is the source of all blessings he desires that the people that he created will bless him so that he can increase the reward in the world to come and bless them in the world with great bounty. Meaning that he desires you blessing him, not for his benefit, but rather for yours. He wants to have another reason to give you more good. It's just like a parent wants, desires to have their kids do the homework, have their kids eat healthy food, have their kids sleep good. Not because the parent benefits out of the kid sleeping good or eating good or, or doing good in school. You don't benefit out of it. But you want it because you know it's good for your kids. And you want your kids to have good. Same concept here. But even more so, Rabbeinu Bechaya explains, the mitzvah of reciting blessings is to people's benefits, not to God's benefit. Where God is the source of all blessings. And he has no need for us to bless him. It's not even possible for him to gain, even if we would bless him constantly, day and night. We are the ones who gain through reciting these blessings. Where when we recite the blessings, before eating a snack, food, or anything like that, what we're doing is we're testifying that God watches over us and that he is the one who supplied us all of our needs. And thereby, because of that recognition, God now follows His rule, says, oh, they bless me, they recognize I'm the source of all good, now I'm going to give more good. Now I'm going to give more good. Not because He needs to give more good, but rather He wants to give more good, but it has to be recognized. It has to be recognized, just like if you spoil your kids for no purpose, you're just ruining the kids. So Hashem has rules, not for His benefit, but for the benefit of the children. For the benefit of the children. Now, this most people understand. What most people will not understand, initially, is what the same Gemara says. A person that doesn't bless Hashem before he eats, before he drinks, before he benefits from anything. Doesn't bless Hashem. He's not just a thief. He's like Yerovam ben Nevat, Rasha Merusha, Machtia Rabim. Yerovam ben Nevat? What? Just because I, I don't say blessings? I'm like Yerovam ben Nevat? Yerovam ben Nevat? You know who Yerovam is? He took Am Yisrael, told him, don't go to the Bet Mikdash. Go pray to the golden calf. Remember the golden calf in Mount Sinai? I have two of them. He made two golden calves. So what, you didn't bless Hashem, you're like him? She didn't bless Hashem. Before she ate some peach, some orange, she's like, Yerovam, how? Nah, this must be an exaggeration. If your initial reaction is, this must be an exaggeration, this can't be true, that means falsehood is the dominant force currently in your life. Now, if the sages say it, it must be true. If we don't know why it's true, it's our lacking. So what's the explanation? Explanation is as follows. The Chachamim teach us, in the name of Rabbi Shlomo Zalman Oyerbach, in Sefer Alichot Shlomo, in the footnote, page 271, he explains the pshat of this Gemara. He says, what was the Mishkan for? What was the Bet HaMikdash for? To get closer to Hashem. But you can't just live in the Bet HaMikdash. At some point you have to go home. In fact, some of you are not going to live in Yerushalayim. You're going to live in Tveria. You're going to live in Netanya. You're going to live in Tzfat. You're going to live in all types of places. 
But that's why the Torah says three times a year we had to go up to the Bet Mikdash. Shlosha Regalim. Sukkot, Shavuot, and Pesach. That's where we had to go. Why do we have to go? To give donations? We can send donations. To what? To pray? We can pray home. Why go? The ultimate purpose was to get closer to Hashem. To get closer to Hashem. That was the purpose of going to the Bet HaMikdash. Yerovam ben Nevat the Rasha Merusha. What did he do? He didn't want people to go to the Bet HaMikdash. So what did he do? He said, go pray to golden calves. Two of them. He blocked their way. He got Am Yisrael to not get closer to Hashem. And therefore, he was the worst of the worst. How does that apply to blessings? What's the blessing for? When you bless Hashem, before you eat a peach, before you eat an orange, before you drink something, after you relieve yourself, all of these different blessings, what is it for? It's one of the seven mitzvot of the rabbis, the sages. There are seven mitzvot, the 613 mitzvot from the Torah, and there's seven from the sages. You have blessings, you have a, uh, the Hallel, the, you say on Rosh Chodesh and on holidays, you have the uh, Iruv, you have Chanukah, uh, Purim, uh, the, um, uh, what do you have also? We have uh, five. Uh, let's see, let's see, we have five. Netilat uh, Yadaim, and also the candles of Shabbat. Candles of Shabbat. So seven blessings, seven mitzvot of the rabbi, 613 from the Torah. One of them is blessings. What is the purpose of the blessings? What is the purpose of the blessing? To get closer to Hashem. To get closer to Hashem. That's the purpose. It's not because Hashem needs your blessing. If you think that Hashem needs your blessings, you're a heretic, can't count you in minyan. Can't use you for any Jewish ceremony. Hashem doesn't need you. You need Hashem. So why bless Him? To recognize Hashem's greatness. To recognize and be grateful. To get closer to Hashem. The purpose of every single blessing is to get closer to Hashem no different than going to the Bet HaMikdash. In so many words, you going to the Bet HaMikdash and you making a blessing on an orange has exactly the same purpose. Therefore, the reason why the Gemara says, when you do not make blessings, you're considered like Yerovam ben Nevat. It's because Yerovam ben Nevat's purpose, mission, and unfortunately, success was getting Am Yisrael not to achieve the closest to Hashem, and getting Am Yisrael away from Hashem. When you don't make blessings, you also succeed in distancing yourself from Hashem, not recognizing your, your, uh, your Creator, not being grateful, and unfortunately, not achieving that closeness that you're supposed to. So we see here, Rabotai, one small, tiny, tiny example of something where if a person doesn't accept the truth just on face value, it's easy to say this is an exaggeration. This cannot be true. But that's the point. If the, a person wants to live the truth, it's not just knowing where the truth is. The truth is in the Torah. Knowing where God, you know, that God is the creator. That's not enough. You can know the truth but live a lie. You can know the truth but live a lie. It's also about accepting the truth. And accepting the truth sometimes has to be even before you understand why it is what it is. So we have, Rabotai, many different places in our day-to-day -day life where a person can test themselves and see where their red line is. Where their red line is. We saw that Am Yisrael at the time of Purim, even though they had Mordechai, Tzadik, Kadosh, they had prophets, but unfortunately, 
They also had some bad people mislead them where told them that it was okay to go to a party where this Persian monster is celebrating that the Bet HaMikdash was not built and somehow justifying that the Jewish people also have to attend this party. And they went. Over 18,000 Jews went to this party. And this party wasn't one night. It was for six months. Six months party. So their line of truth, they knew obviously Hashem. They knew, they heard the, 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 you know, everything. They have prophets. They have miracles. But their line was, yeah, but we're scared of this king. We're scared of what people are going to think about us. We're scared of being excluded. We're scared of everything but Hashem. Knowing Hashem, but not being scared a person can test themselves also and see perhaps they're not so different from the generation of Purim, where if they were part of that generation, they would get the same decree that Haman would get the right to kill them. A person can say, listen, I believe in Hashem, but I'm still going to go to the office party. I'm still going to go to the forbidden party. I'm still going to go to a party where I know I'm not allowed to go to. Because there's mixed dancing, there's immorality, there's uh, non-kosher behavior, non-kosher food. I'm still going to go because I'm afraid of what people are going to think. I'm afraid of being fired. I'm afraid that people are going to think that I'm strange. I'm afraid of how people are going to feel. So that's where your line is. That's where your line is. Some people line, their line is in business. They could be very good at going to shul, praying, but a thief in business. A thief in business. They could be in a cash advance business and literally steal for a living. But they'll justify it because some rabbi that doesn't know his right or left of what the actual halacha is told them it's allowed, it's allowed. Why? Because they found some verse in the Torah that says it's allowed to, to, to lend to Gentiles, so it's allowed for you to lend. Never investigating what the business actually does, never investigating what the real halacha is. Allowed, allowed. Why? Because he also has a line. What's his line? As long as you're donating to me, it's allowed. If you're donating to somewhere else, not allowed. So sometimes people's line of where their truth, knowledge, separates from their living is when it comes to money. When it comes to money. But sometimes a person just doesn't want to believe, believe the truth. They just don't. Why? Because either it'll cost them money or because they don't want to be wrong. For example, we've said several times over the years in the name of Ochachamim, not something we created, don't buy tefillin and mezuzot from just anybody. Why? Because there are certain things when it comes to tefillin and mezuzot that you don't know about to the extent where no one will be able to tell you that this tefillin or this mezuzah is not kosher. Even if you check it every day, every year, every month, it doesn't make a difference. Why? People think when we say get tefillin only from kosher people that know who the scribe is, they think, oh, yeah, that's probably because he has better writing or maybe because it's better material. No, no, you're not understanding. One of the things that people don't understand is that there are certain laws when it comes to, when it comes to tefillin that their application is not something that you can see. You can't test for it. For example, if you have certain letters and they connect together, obviously that makes the tefillin of the mezuzah pasul, that it's not valid, that you can test for, that you can check for. But if the person writing the tefillin is a kosher person or not, that you can't test for, unless you test the person. Which means that if you bought the tefillin from some online store, 
that uh, you don't even know who's behind it. You bought it on eBay. You bought it from uh, some guy that stole it from somebody. You bought it on Amazon. You bought it from an unknown seller that you don't actually know who wrote the tefillin. You don't know if that person's even Jewish and you don't even know, even if they are Jewish, you don't know if they're a kosher person and even if they are a Shomer Shabbat person, it doesn't mean that they're a kosher person to write tefillin. One of the stories Rabbi Vadya had told that the Yakut Yosef brings as well in Ilchot Tefillin is that Rabbi Vadya was told that there's one guy that became very popular in the world of Tefillin in Eretz Yisrael. People like his writing, his uh, things. And many people bought Tefillin from him. One day, this guy came and saw the rabbi and the rabbi took the opportunity to ask him some questions. And he says uh, to him, oh, you write the tefillin? Yeah, rabbi, people like it. You know, we're doing good things to help Am Yisrael. He said, tell me, tell me, how, how do you write tefillin? He said, rabbi, it comes to me naturally. I just write. I just write them. You know, I, I love it. No, no, I understand. But how do you write? Oh, you know, I take the ink and I write. No, no, no. Tell me, walk me through. Let's just say I'm, I'm going to give you a parchment. What do you do? Start. So the guy says, take the parchment, I, parchment, I start writing. That's how I start my day. I start writing. That's it. Yeah, yeah, no, I just start and, uh, you know, I try to dedicate as much time as possible until I'm finished. Oh, okay. All of your tefillin are not kosher. What? How? How would you know? Why? The letters are not connecting. It has nothing to do with the letters. There's a law, an halacha, that you have to make a statement before you start writing tefillin, which you apparently don't. And that means all of your tefillin are not kosher. And this is not something you can't check for. Why? No one that's looking at your tefillin would ever know if this guy ever made the statement or not. So the writing could be perfect. The ink could be pristine. The material that they made the tefillin from, absolutely mehudal. But the tefillin are not kosher. Why? This guy doesn't know the laws. Another example. There's a law where the letters have to be created from writing. Now the average person would say, of course from writing, where is it going to be from? No, you're not understanding. You as a regular person, perhaps that hasn't learned the laws of tefillin yet, are not going to know what I'm talking about. And that's why there's a point. When their person is writing tefillin, or a mezuzah, sometimes the person, the, the ink runs, or he pushed a little bit too much, and let's say the hay that is made out of, let's say, two letters, a tzeresh and a yud, it connects, the ink connects between the top and the bottom, and it becomes a new letter, it becomes a chet instead of a hey. So, what you can do, if you want a hey, not for tefillin, just to make a hey, is you can scratch off the extra ink from the parchment, and now you have an A. So you have an A, but you also have a letter that was not made from writing. Rather, the letter was made from erasing. And therefore, the tefillin are not kosher. Which means, if the scribe does not have yirat shamayim, forget about knowledge, even if he has the knowledge, but he does not have fear of heaven, that when he makes the mistake to simply discard all of his work and put it in the gniza, instead of erasing it and no one's going to know, you, my friend, could be wearing tefillin that's not kosher for 20 years and not even know it. The point is, Rabotai, living honesty is not the same as knowing honesty. Knowing honesty is that you know you need kosher tefillin. You know you need kosher mezuzah. You know you need to donate for Torah. You know you need to be honest in business. You know you need to be loyal to your spouse. You know you need to believe in one God. You know you need all of these things. 
But that knowledge will not make you honest. That knowledge will make you knowledgeable. What makes you honest? Living according to all of those standards. Living according to all of those rules. And applying those rules through thick and thin. Regardless of how you feel about it, how you understand it, and in fact, how it even affects you, even if it causes you to lose. This was the difference between Mordechai and the rest of the generation. Mordechai represented the Torah, the people that went to the party represented themselves. When a person represents themselves in the world, that means that even if they recognize that Hashem is the king, He is not the king that's ruling them. Rather, the king that's ruling them is their evil inclination, which is the Satan. He is the king that's ruling them. When a person listens to their own inclinations, their own ideas, and does what stupid people do, like this one woman who has started a movement to tell women to tell their husbands that they're not going to be together with them on mikveh night until they pretty much turn the world upside down to convince some guy to give his wife a get. So they're going to possibly get divorced themselves or at the very least lead their husband to make a wasting seed, uh, uh, some type of sin of karet, fighting, all types of problems. Why? Because you want to help somebody get divorced. So you're going to create other divorces. You're going to create Chilul Hashem. You're going to desecrate the name of Hashem. You're going to stop a mitzvah of Purbu. You're going to stop a mitzvah of Ona'a. You're going to what? Because... It makes sense to you. It makes sense to her that in order to help one person, we have to threaten every family. We have to threaten every Jewish home. This is a person that if they don't do tshuva, and if her followers don't do tshuva, the genom that they're going to get literally will not have an end. Why? Because you're taking Hashem's most prized possession, which is Kedusha, Kedusha is intimacy for anyone that watched our series based on the Ramban of Jewish intimacy. Kedusha is the ultimate connection to Hashem. It's the ultimate uh, appreciation for why we are what we are. If a person understands what Kedusha is, to take Kedusha and throw it in the garbage because your mind told you that this is what you need to do There is literally no worse thought that you could have ever had in your lifetime than the one you had. You are no different than Yeruvan ben Nevat currently. Yeruvan ben Nevat had an opportunity to do tshuva. He didn't. You have an opportunity to do tshuva too. Will you? Will you stop concluding what people need to do based on your opinion and start looking at what Torah says? Or are you going to conclude that you decide what Torah is going to say? This is what people do every day, unfortunately. You can know the truth, but not live it. You can know the truth, but live a lie. Why? Because the truth is not just based on knowledge, Rabbutai. Moshe Rabbeinu tells us, believing in God is easy. Understanding that God gave the Torah to Moshe Rabbeinu and the sages are great, easy. Recognizing that the world of Torah, scholars, needs to continue, easy. Living in accordance to the laws with complete honesty, that's where things get more difficult. Why? Because honesty shouldn't have a red line. It's either true or it's false. 99% truth equals 100% falsehood. Which means that every single one of us needs to make those decisions each and every single day and not just decide 
where the truth fits our agenda and where the truth doesn't fit. Because if we're living that way, literally, there's no end to the amount of lies that we'll have to pay for. Bezat Hashem, this too will help us live the truth, publicize the truth, and never make up what the truth is. Rather, learn what it is and live according to it. Now, you guys could ask some questions and Bezat Hashem HaKadosh Baruch will give us the answers. What's the Rav's thoughts on the constant topic of a gunat and get withholders that has been going around lately? It seems both sides have a solid point and it can get confusing to know what's the right thing. Um, apparently, this is what I just talked about. As far as having a uh, people that want to get divorced, the people that are familiar with the world of of Torah are not all bent out of shape over this as much as the public that is not familiar with the world of Torah is. The reason why is because the public is looking at the world of, of, of uh, Jewish divorce from a secular perspective, from a non-Jewish perspective, meaning if she wants to leave, it, you know, therefore he should let her go. That's not how Jewish marriage works according to the Torah. Just because she wants to leave doesn't mean he should let her go. Now, again, doesn't mean that a person should torture his wife, but just because a woman decides to pick up and leave and go find herself a new boyfriend does not mean that a husband should give her a get. So when the average person in society looks at it from a secular non-Jewish perspective, of course they're going to pick the women's perspective where they're going to say, listen, she doesn't want to live with them. He should let her go. That's it. Yes, if the non-Jewish law is what you're living according to, you're right. What's the debate about? Go to divorce court, in the goyim court, and that's it. Decide over there. But if you're living according to Jewish law, it doesn't work that way. It simply does not work that way. So a person that's not familiar with the halacha, is not familiar with the circumstances, cannot put their two senses into it. Now, of course, there are some bad people out there that torture the wife, don't want to be with the wife, and still not let her go just to punish her. Sure, there are some people like that. But I could assure you, that's not the majority of the cases. It's not the majority of the cases. Most people, generally speaking, are decent people. Even if they're upset at somebody, they have kids with them and so on, they're not looking to necessarily cause that person so much agony and and pain. Usually there is a reason behind everything. There's a reason why they don't want to give the get. There's a reason why, uh, you know, there's this whole thing happened in the first place. And when ignorant people like that moron that calls herself some uh, something girl, whatever, she's the one that's promoting uh, women not to be with their husbands just to, in order to help other women get a get. This is the most, literally, the most moronic thing in the world. You're going to create more divorces in order to uh, uh, help one person get their get. It's, it's, it's just, it's stupid, both spiritually and otherwise. But nonetheless... If nobody's going to speak about it, we'll throw our hat into it and make sure that people know whoever listens to her will go to the same chamber in Genom with her. Same chamber in Genom. Now, does that mean that every husband that doesn't want to give a get is right? Absolutely not. Some of them are right. Some of them are wrong. How can you possibly understand who's right, who's wrong? You have to not only know the situation between the couple of what happened, but you also have to know the law. You have to know the law. You have to know the Torah law. You can't just decide to do what you want, how you want, because you live in America, because you live in Australia, because you live in Israel. You have to live according to the Torah. Now, you don't want to live according to the Torah. What do you care about a get? Don't get a get. Go marry some, uh, go marry some cow, have a few sheep as kids, and who cares what you do? But if you want to live according to the Torah, Torah all the way, That means if you don't get a get, you never get married. That means that if you get a get, you get married. That means that you live according to the Torah through thick and thin. 
But to go and make a big stink about it and this whole Chilul Hashem that's going on over there and people making new rules and protests and, and, and giving certain uh, people a bad name, sometimes it's warranted, sometimes it's not. And I can tell you this, even if you have a hundred protests, a hundred protests, let's say the same hundred morons protest. Why do I call mor- the morons? Because people that protest are morons. Generally speaking, they're morons. Why? You don't get to anything beneficial through protests. You don't. There are better ways to do things. Protests are just commotion, annoying, and it, nothing, nothing conducive happens. Either way, you have a right to protest because you're Americans. So, 100 people protest against 100 bad husbands. Okay? 100 people don't want to give a get. Let's just give. And they're going to go outside of his house and say, you... Let her go. Give her the get. No, no, we won't go. No, no, we won't go. We're stupid. Then we're going to be here all night because we want nothing to do with. Right? They're going to do that. Let's say they're right on 99 people. 99 people. They're bad people. You have permission to make fun of them, to do this, to do. Let's just say if they're wrong on one, one guy they did this to and they're wrong all of them lose olam abba. all of them lose abba. hence the reason why i call them morons the downside of doing these things in such a way in such a barbaric way such a non-torah way is literally just something that People do not understand the ramifications of just in case they're wrong. Now again, I have some people sending me emails about, oh, help me with this get, help me with that get. I don't get involved in that world. Well, unless I know you and I know her and I know what's going on, I'm generally not involved in that stuff. And even when I do know, I try not to get involved if I can can avoid it. If I can avoid it, I don't get involved. Sometimes I have to get involved. And when I get involved, I tell the people what they have to do. If that means give her a get, that means give her a get. If I mean give her a get, but later on, because there are certain things that have to happen first, then that's what I tell them. Tell them whatever is going to be the best thing for everybody. Sometimes people think, oh, but no, listen, we're going to get divorced anyway, so why don't you just give the get now? No, 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 it doesn't work that way. Why? Because you have a track record of being an evil person. And if you get the get, you could hurt them in a civil court and you could do certain things. So don't just think that just because they both agree not to live together anymore, that means that the get comes first. It doesn't work that way. When you don't know the Allah, when you don't know the people, when you don't know the ramifications, you could just decide like secular people decide. But what happens is when morons lead people, in essence, mislead people, and they have some puppet rabbis that go on videos with them because they want more likes. They want to be feminists. What ends up happening is that people can go to these protests. People can follow these instructions and do these things, desecrate the Torah, desecrate the name of Hashem, and literally think that they're doing the right thing. And as I said, even if they were right 99 out of 100 times, which is a statistical impossibility, even if they were right 99 out of 100 times, they still lost Olam Abba. Why? One time you're wrong on all of that. One time you're wrong on all of that, that's it, you're finished. All of those people have no Olam Abba. Now when a person doesn't believe what I just said, that means either they don't know Torah or they don't believe the Torah. Why? Because that's what the Torah says. That's what the Torah says, to go and, 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 and make rules that make sense to you. That's a form of megale panim ba Torah, making new rules. So, most important conclusion is, if you know all of the laws in regards to Gitim, which means that you are a Dayan at this point, or at the very least a serious Torah scholar, and you know the situation with all of the ugly details, then you have a, you can make a, a statement of what you think about this particular issue. Not publicize it, but to help the couple that doesn't want to be a couple. You don't know the rules, 
or you don't know the couple and all the details, you only know one version of the story, or you heard what you heard, where you heard, your source of information is the media or who's who, stay out of it. Why? You're risking olam abba. You're risking living what happened in the game. No movie that we made, living that for a thousand years or more. You're risking. So it's better not to say in places where the ramifications are much, much higher than the reward. Could you explain the difference between redemption and salvation? Also, I already explained this was last week's question. I said, you know, there's, there's redemption and salvation. We talked about it last week. There's someone that went to the uh, Mizgad, which is of the Muslims, and uh, ripped the Quran. Okay, am I part of that group? No, I'm not part of that group. I'm not necessarily a fan of the Quran, but I wouldn't rip the Quran, uh, not in public or, uh, or in private. I could rip on it, meaning I could tell you that it's a mistake, it's completely full of nonsense, it's, it's full of lies, it's a, a you know, a... Uh, horrible belief system that leads to terrorism and aggression as i've quoted places in the quran that uh, specifically uh, tell people that they should be uh, um, terrorists and liars and horrible people uh, but to go rip it won't do them any good it's just simply going to waste time and uh, not necessarily going to be uh, anything that uh, is going to help anybody on either side Right. Okay, let's see. Okay, we have here. Yeah. Have you guys ever read the Quran? Uh, Allah says the Quran is giving you guys the upper hand if you use it right. I've read enough of the Quran to know that it's full of falsehood and anything that's true in it, they stole from the Torah. Rabbi, when are you taking questions? Now. Rabbi, if I live to see the coming of Mashiach, will I have to endure Gehenom and Kafa Kela? Uh, that depends. If uh, just because somebody has the merit to see Mashiach doesn't necessarily mean that they are uh, perfect, uh, but uh, again, the details are, uh, are extensive, meaning that even if a person has the merit to see Mashiach, uh, the Chachamim say that they would still have to endure death, the pain of death. Everybody has to die at least once. So that's a certain amount of pain. Now, as far as a, uh, whether a person is... Um, has to go to Gehenom for a certain amount of time or not, depends on their actions, depends if they've done tshuva for everything that they've done. Now, uh, they may have the merit to see Mashiach, but they still have some mistakes that they didn't fix yet. So for that, they'll have to clean the neshama, and since they ran out of time, since the Mashiach arrived, they'll have to clean the neshama in Gehenom. Furthermore, there is also different a uh, 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 path to Gan Eden. Uh, the, when a uh, neshama goes from uh, chamber to chamber in Gan Eden, uh, it's, uh, or even when Hashem goes to Gan Eden, it has to go through Nahar Dinu, which is fire. Furthermore, when a Neshama go, is elevated from one level of Gan Eden to another level of Gan Eden, meaning it got better, uh, it also has to be cleaned up because the judgment is uh, you know, more particular. Things that were allowed in the first chamber are forbidden in the second chamber, which means that a person has to clean that. Sometimes cleaning that is fire. Sometimes cleaning that is a reincarnation. That's why sometimes tzaddikim will reincarnate as a fish. 
uh, or, or other things just for, the, or, uh, you know, just for the sake of doing a specific tikkun. Uh, that's why sometimes, for example, there's a person will have a chas uh, v'shalom, uh, but a person could have a baby that uh, dies uh, shortly after they're uh, born. That baby that died shortly after they were born is a neshama of a uh, tzaddik, of a righteous person many times. Not all the time, but many times they are. They're a neshama of a tzaddik that had to do a, sh- a tikkun of living in this world for a short period of time. An extra five minutes, an extra hour, an extra five months, whatever it is, in order for that neshama to go to the next level. So it's to just say, if I, you know, if I see, if I'm righteous, I'm never going to see Ganam is not necessarily uh, true. Uh, at the same token, to say that you're going to be there for years and years is also not true. So again, it, it, the, the the judgment is, you know, very, very uh, uh, precise, to say the least. And general statements don't do anybody any good. We can't give, uh, you know, uh, every detail about every single thing. But to make general statements like it's just saying, no, you'll be fine. If you're righteous, you're fine. And uh, you're never going to see Ganem. It's just, just simply not true. And this is also one of the examples that uh, you know I'm trying to, to, to tell you guys today is that if something is true, you have to stick with it. You can't alter the truth just for the sake of appeasing people. So it's, it's a, the, the subject of reward and punishment is an ex- huge subject. And... The vast majority of people don't have even, uh, you know, uh, an inclination of, of what it is, Bichlad. Most, many people don't even believe in judgment. They think that it's, you know, uh, just a place of uh, everybody goes to heaven. And there's literally nothing further from the truth. The vast majority of people do not go to heaven, ever. Why? They're wicked. Simple. They're wicked. That's what the Gemara says. Gemara says, heaven is... A uh, sixty times the size of Earth, uh, but Genom is no size, meaning it's not only much much bigger than heaven, but it continues to grow. Why? Because there's simply many more wicked wicked people. There's many more wicked people. Now, does that mean that uh, you're going to go to to uh, Genom? Not necessarily. It depends on your actions. What everybody else did shouldn't necessarily mean that you're going to do the same thing. But it's 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 um, ignorant and, and and naive to to believe that everyone's going to go to heaven, or to, if you're overall a decent person, that's it. You're uh, going to be in the same place as Moshe Rabbeinu. You have to understand that there is a judge, and that judge has a system, and that system is more precise than you could ever possibly imagine. And the more you learn about it, the more you realize why David HaMelech, Moshe Rabbeinu, Avraham Avinu, all of the great sages that ever lived were terrified, terrified of the judgment. Meaning, the most righteous, holy, and, and, and Torah observant and dedicated people that ever lived were terrified of the judgment. So, we are practically homeless in mitzvot and in good deeds in comparison to these great tzaddikim. At the very least, we should be scared. At the very least, we should try more and more to be better. That's it. And not live in, in, in a deluded mentality that uh, as long as you don't murder people, you're okay. Because it just doesn't work that way. Rabbi, can you talk to us more about the thousand years after Mashiach? Uh, I've already said everything I could say about it. I mean, the thousand years after Mashiach is going to be a thousand years in this world. Uh, the uh, world will still operate um, according to the nature that we have now, meaning that you're uh, still uh, going to have, you know, gravity and you know the, the rules of uh, of, of the world. Uh, there is a debate of whether people uh, will uh, continue to give birth or not. Uh, there is uh, a lot of debates of the details of what's going to happen during that thousand years, and hence the reason why the Rambam says we're only going to know for sure what's going to happen after it happens. 
We're only going to know what's going to happen after the Mashiach comes, after it happens. You know, there's a debate of when the resurrection of the dead is going to be. Some say it's going to be uh, 40 years after Mashiach arrives. Some say different times. Uh, you know, there's, there's uh, things that uh, the sages have, uh, have stated about every part of it. But again, none of it is uh, set in stone. There is different traditions there, uh, and different possibilities also based on our actions. It's not that he's right and he's wrong, but rather because there are multiple possibilities available based on how we get there. Based on how we get there and how HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants to glorify his name. So there is no limitations and there's no like, this has to happen this way. It's not that way. Uh, Hashem can do whatever He wants, and obviously we know and are aware of some of the possibilities, but not everything. How many Jews made it to the promised land? If you're talking about the time of Moshe Rabbeinu, uh, you had a, uh, the entire people that uh, came out of Egypt, uh, out of all the people that were in Egypt, uh, only 20% left Egypt. The other 80% Hashem killed them in Egypt. Um, and 20% is the best case scenario. Could be even less. Uh, out of the 20%, that uh, left Egypt, uh, only a, uh, a very, very uh, few actually uh, came to uh, the land of Israel. Um, the vast majority, meaning like 99% of them, uh, died uh, in the desert as a punishment for their not having uh, full uh, belief in Hashem and uh, the 10 tests that they tested Hashem with. Uh, one of them being that uh, the, uh, the Meraglim, so Hashem uh, made them die uh, in the desert and only their children uh, and grandchildren uh, were the ones that actually entered the land of Israel with the exception of the last generation, meaning every year uh, another group of those people that sinned with the, uh, with the spies died until the last year of the 40 years, that, uh, that generation did not die. So uh, there is also the leaders, Caleb ben Yefuneh, uh, Yeshua Benun, Pinchas, and a few others that also entered the land of Israel, even though they were alive at the time of the Meraglim. So the vast majority that left Egypt uh, did not go enter the land of Israel, but some did. The, the majority that entered the land of Israel were their children and their grandchildren and so on. As far as the actual number, it was millions of people. It wasn't... Uh... Uh, you know, five people, millions of people. Who makes your uh, films? They're very powerful. Uh, the uh, we have a team. We have a fantastic team of people that uh, work very hard, and uh, we invest a lot of time and money to make everything. Uh, How would you, would you mind talking about how would we recognize when Mashiach comes? Uh, you don't need to recognize. It's simply going to be known by everybody in the world, both the enemies and the uh, friends. I know that the Mashiach is going to come. It's going to be the culmination of, uh, you know, the, the climax of this world, just like Mount Sinai. 
uh, was known by everyone around the world. Hashem made sure that everyone knew that Hashem is giving the Jewish people the Torah. Uh, everyone knew that Hashem split the uh, Sea of Reeds. Everyone knew that Hashem took the Jewish people out of Egypt. Uh, Hashem made sure that everybody knew uh, and saw certain things, felt certain things, uh, and uh, it was common knowledge. And one of the ways that we know that the whole world knew is when the uh, spies uh, 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 went to um, Israel uh, the second time uh, when uh, they spoke to uh, Rachav. They spoke to Rachav. Rachav uh, told them she was a non-Jew at the time. She told them that uh, we heard about the great miracles that uh, God uh, did for you and that he gave you the Torah, uh, and I uh, believe in them. So Rachav heard everything that happened in the desert, even though there was no internet, there was no news stations, everyone in the world knew uh, what happened. So the, if, that, if Hashem made sure that everyone back then knew uh, that uh, he is obviously uh, the God of Israel, he's the creator of the world, he gave us the Torah, then needless to say, the next climatic point uh, in uh, creation, which is the arrival of Mashiach, he's going to make sure that everyone knows that this is Mashiach and there's no doubts. Anytime we had false Mashiachs, there were always doubts, there were always people that went against and some people that went for. No one ever said where conclusively everyone agreed this is Mashiach. You know, on anyone. I mean, not on Yoshke, and not on Shabtai Tzvi, and not on any of the hundreds of other false messiahs that happened throughout history. Uh, there's been hundreds of false messiahs. Uh, most of them weren't as successful in causing damage like uh, Yeshu was and uh, Shabtai Tzvi, uh, but, uh, or Yaakov Frank, but needless to say, there were some that uh, uh, were successful, but not anywhere near the same level. Uh, but the point being is, there was always people that did not believe. The real Mashiach arrives, everyone will know. Both the enemies of the Mashiach that will fight against him to try to overcome him, to try to destroy him, to try to uh, rule the world, and the tzaddikim, the righteous people that have been waiting for him. Everyone will know. Uh, one of the things that will also happen is that uh, Eliyahu Navi uh, is going to uh, announce that he's coming three days before he comes. Some Chachamim say that he could even announce it on the same day. It doesn't necessarily have to be three days like the prophet. Uh, one of the prophets, he says it'll come three days before, but it doesn't have to be three days. It could be the same day. That's what the Maharsha says. Uh, but needless to say, there is a, uh, an announcement of him coming. A prophet is also going to be uh, a uh, sanctification process of the Mashiach where, uh, you, know, there you know, the uh, Eliyahu Navi is going to have to take the special oil of Moshe Rabbeinu uh, and uh, put it on the, uh, you know, on the Mashiach in order to empower him uh, the, uh, just like uh, the, uh, they did with the Kohanim and the kings. Uh, so it's, it's going to be a whole process. And like I said, once he becomes Mashiach, there will not be any doubts. Uh, he's not going to announce himself as the Mashiach. He's not going to feel like he's the Mashiach. Uh, he's not going to make a YouTube channel to say that he's Mashiach. So in so many words, all of these people that you see uh, or you hear or you know, or even if it's you yourself, that you feel like you're Mashiach, that in itself, you're not Mashiach. That in itself shows you're not Mashiach. Why? Because it's you're not following the, the certain requirements to be Mashiach. Uh, you know, the certain one of the requirements is extraordinary righteousness, Torah scholarship, a dedication to God. It's a, uh, it's, it's, it's not, it's, it's, it's certainly not a feeling. Your feeling that you're Mashiach is a combination of arrogance with craziness, a little bit of delusion. Uh, perhaps you have some gas. Maybe uh, you took some drugs that are having an aftershock and a few other things. You're definitely not Mashiach. Uh, people that have all types of uh, write-ups or YouTube channels and videos talking about how they're Mashiach, I can assure you, they're not Mashiach. Mashiach will not announce himself. Mashiach will not announce himself. Secondly, Mashiach will not be doubted. No one will doubt that somebody's the Mashiach. So if people are saying, is so-and-so the Mashiach? 
if there's even a question whether he is or he isn't Mashiach, that by itself, by default, means he's not Mashiach. By default, if they're asking whether he is or he isn't Mashiach, whoever that he or is, or sometimes she, because people are crazy because they somehow think that there's a woman who's going to be Mashiach, if there's a question, that means they're not. That means they're not. Now, it means they're not. Now, could they possibly be? If they have all the right, uh, qualifications, it could possibly be in the future. You know, a person that's alive today and uh, Hashem decides to make the Mashiach next week, by all means. But if people are asking whether he is or he is today, that means he's not. Why? Because when Mashiach arrives, there will not be a question. Not from the enemies and not from the friends. So there are certain things. And again, like I said, people that think that their rabbi is Mashiach or that they are Mashiach themselves, or their kids are Mashiach. There's one woman that told me that she thinks her son is Mashiach. Another woman told me she thinks her daughter is Mashiach. Uh, another non-Jew told me that he's Mashiach. And there's at least, I don't know, maybe dozens of non-Jews that think that they're Mashiach. So there's all types of crazy people out there. Certainly there's some people that believe the uh, Lubavitch Rebbe, Alava Shalom, who passed on already over 30 years ago, think he's Mashiach. Uh, some even people think he's become one with God, which obviously makes them idol worshippers. There's, of course, billions of people that uh, call Yeshu a Mashiach, but in reality, their definition of Mashiach is actually another word for God. So they're all uh, idol worshippers. So there's a lot of crazies out there. The point is, is a person needs to know God has rules for himself that he gave us in the Torah. One of the things that he promised us is that no other people, not big or small, will ever claim that God spoke to them. No other people. Now, this is something that if God wasn't running the world, could easily be changed tomorrow. There could be a group of 10 people say, come back on the news, God spoke to all of us together. We're not talking about millions of people, 10 people. 10 people say, God spoke to all of us together. God said, this will never happen. The only people that ever said that God spoke to all of us is Am Yisrael. Why? Because God spoke to them. And God said that this will never happen again. The events that took place at Mount Sinai, God said, will never happen to anybody else. Mashiach is that next climatic point in in creation. Just like there was creation itself, destruction of creation, you know, at the time of Noah, there is obviously... uh, the uh, uh, downward spiral all the way to Egypt, or upward uh, to, to Mount Sinai, culmination of the world at a uh, Matan Torah, receiving the Torah. Obviously, we had a couple of stop points of great times and bad times during the Bet HaMikdash. And then eventually the ultimate culmination of the world is, uh, or the next one is the arrival of Mashiach. And every one of these points that I mentioned to you, everyone knew. Everyone knew, everyone agreed. There was no different opinions. There was no Muslim saying, no, there was no uh, Mount Sinai. There was no Christian saying, there's no Mount Sinai. There's no Buddhist saying, no Mount Sinai. Nobody said that. Everyone agreed. There was Am Yisrael. There's Mount Sinai. God spoke to all of them. Everybody heard. Everybody saw. Everybody was there. There was no question. Mashiach is that next point, which means Hashem will make sure that there is no question. How do I know? Because the prophet says it. Prophet Jeremiah, Prophet Yechezkel, all of the prophets talk about it different times of, uh, of end of times. One of the things Jeremiah says is that the, everything that happened in Egypt will be magnified at the, for the time of Mashiach, meaning everything that happened back then will be even more before Mashiach comes and when Mashiach comes. So it's important for a person to know that all of these you know, uh, uh, um, speculations, feelings, rumors, all of that, by default, is against the rules. By default, shows us that the truth is, whoever you think is Mashiach is not. Why? Because when he arrives, everyone will know, without a doubt, including from the enemy. Meaning that even Amalek knew that we received the Torah. Even Amalek knew that Hashem gave us the Torah. Even Amalek knew that we are the chosen people. 
They still wanted to go to war with us. They still went to war with us. And they're still going to be at war with us at the time of Mashiach, even though they know. Meaning just because somebody knows the truth doesn't mean they live it. It's the subject of our entire lecture tonight. So the enemy and the righteous people are going to know of the truth, of the arrival of the Mashiach, who he is, and there's not going to be any doubts. So you do not need to waste any energy looking for Mashiach. All you got to do is spend all of your energy preparing for Mashiach, which means do tshuva and help other people do tshuva. Once he arrives, you will not have any questions. I promise you, in the name of the Torah. How do you know what God is trying to say? Because he says it. If you read the Torah, then you understand. We have a written Torah, we have an oral Torah. person that doesn't understand how we learn Torah should watch some of the other lectures where we talk about the Torah, how to learn it, how to understand it, the sages, our written Torah, our oral Torah. There's a lot of things that uh, you're missing in order for you to understand the answer. I really wish it didn't sin. I'm so sad and scared I can't handle it. Everybody sins. There's no such thing as a person who doesn't sin. Everybody sins. But the key is to do tshuva, to repent, to say I'm sorry, to not do it again, to help other people also do that, uh, repent, and uh, do tshuva. And that's it. You'll be fine. Any recommendations for rabbis lecturing online like yourself, but in German? Be'ezrat uh, Hashem, we have a German channel, uh, but currently it's with German subtitles. Uh, we are, Be'ezrat Hashem, going to have uh, the lectures in German dubbing, meaning that you'll hear my voice speaking German. Uh, so uh, we don't have to uh, speculate of who is good and who is not. Simply, if you have learned with us in English and understand that everything we say is from the Torah, then uh, you'll be able to also do the same thing in German as well as in Spanish and Bezat Hashem, other languages as well. That's coming very soon. We're investing a fortune into it to Bezat Hashem bring it soon. Rabbi, in the Gemara, in the tractate, Gerim Bet Hillel, tractate Gerim Bet Hillel, tells that if a man are circumcised, he is a proselyte, even if he didn't pass through immersion. But that's not what the Allah is. The Allah is that he has to, there's uh, three different things that have to take place. He has to accept upon himself the mitzvot in front of the bedin. He has to have a circumcision. He has to dip in the mikveh. This is why the Gemara says that all converts will have to uh, bring a sacrifice uh, at the time of Mashiach uh, because that was one of the things that Am Yisrael did at Mount Sinai, which is not possible to do right now. The only thing that's possible to do right now is those three things, which is accepting the, uh, the mitzvot uh, in front of a bedin, uh, that's uh, obviously a uh, kosher bedin, to uh, immerse in a mikveh and for men to be circumcised. Any, uh, anyone that says otherwise is simply mistaken. I'm very well versed in it. Can, can. There's no tractate of Gurim, but I didn't want to bother explaining to them that there's no tractate of Gurim, but you know, it's the answer was. Uh, does Rab Elchanan Vasselman have Sfarim? Yes, of course. Uh, there's a, uh, uh, several, several that he has. Uh, there's a, when we actually did a whole series on Ikvita the Meshicha, we have a whole series on one of his Sfarim. Ikvita the Meshicha, there's also Kovitz Ma'amarim, uh, there's a few, yeah, sure. It was an extraordinary Talmud Chalm. Why 
What does the rabbi have to say about Palestine and Israel? Uh, what is rabbi? Okay. Uh, I say free Palestine. Free Palestine from themselves, from Hamas, from their belief system, from terrorism, and make them decent human beings that could follow the Torah and be righteous Noahides and stop killing people. And yeah, free, free Palestine, free Palestine from the stupidity ideology that they have and, and, and all the stuff that they're doing. Free, free, free Palestine. Is that, is that good? That's what you wanted? Is that what you guys mean by free Palestine? From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Yeah, that, 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 yeah, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free from terrorism, from stupidity, from murdering people, from the warped ideology they have. From the Islam that's controlling them into, and turning them into terrorists. From you guys like like my dance? Should we should we should we like should we do dubbing maybe in in, in Arabic? Huh? Free Palestine? Yeah, you got it. Until now, I've been telling you guys Palestine is free. It's Israel, but that's got old already. I gotta got new content, new content, new content for my for my fans, for my fans. Ay, 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 ay. All the questions in the world, that's what you ask. All the questions in the world, that's what you ask. Does one need to make a special meal on a stale to break the fast? Well, you have uh, Purim breaks the fast. You have to re- hear the Megillah. And then uh, you eat. So uh, does it have to be a special feast? Uh, no, the special feast is the next day, but... Certainly, you need to eat something unless you just want to fast for another few days. But usually, people have to eat after they fast the whole day. Okay. If you pray to a shan- well, okay. If you pray to Hashem and you legitimately complain about wrong done to you by a certain person, is it Lashon Ara? Uh, well, it depends what uh, you mean by wrong done to you. If it, it depends, uh, uh, you know, if you have the right definition for what wrong is, but uh, there's no Lashon Ara of you talking to Hashem. You could talk to Hashem about anybody. Uh, he obviously already knows, but uh, you can still talk to him. You could get it off your heart. Uh, certainly, uh, you should talk to him about everything. You should talk to Hashem about everything and not talk to people, though. People, we talk about other people, that's a problem. That's Lashon Ara, Rechilut, all types of problems. But you talk to Hashem, you can talk to Hashem about anybody. Anybody and anything. Why is it so hard for me to do mitzvahs? I wish it was easier because then I can still do them at least uh, it's very easy to do mitzvot in fact you already do them uh, you may not know their mitzvot you may not uh, realize that you're doing them but usually a person wakes up in the morning you wake up so uh, you uh, wake up I wake up difference is I say modani uh, which is a one sentence uh, statement to thank Hashem to give my neshama back. You may not do it, but you, the actual action of waking up, we both do. Then uh, you go to the bathroom, I go to the bathroom. Difference between us is after I go to the bathroom, I thank Hashem for allowing my body to have an open miracle. An open miracle where my body actually worked, where it turned different foods that my body consumed and it kept things that my body needs and removed things that my body does not need. So I thanked Hashem for a open miracle that that's what happened. You may not thank Hashem. Perhaps you don't care if your body works, so you're okay if you're constipated for like three, four, five, six days. You're okay if you just simply, your body stops excreting and then after about a week you die. Or you don't think you need God for it. Or you don't think it's a miracle. I bet you you'll agree that it's a miracle after about, I'd say a good 48 hours of not being able to go to the bathroom or better yet, go to the hospital and ask them for that special treatment they give you when they put a catheter 
They put a catheter into that little hole you have. Uh, and to, in order to help the, uh, the, the, the liquids from your body get out of your body. Ask them for that special treatment they have. Uh, and uh, I, I, I promise you, after that, you will absolutely agree with me that it's a miracle that you're able to go to the bathroom without agonizing pain every single time. In reality, the way our body performs where we're removing things from our body should be the most painful thing in the world. It should be extremely painful. And for some people it is. So if you go to the bathroom without really much of a uh, pain, in fact, it's relieving, that's an open miracle. The difference between us is that I say thank you, you may not. You eat, I eat. We both eat. Difference is, I say thank you to Hashem before I eat and thank you to Hashem after I eat. I bless Him. I recognize Him. I know that I wouldn't have what to eat without Him. You may not. You don't think that you need Hashem to eat because you think that just because you have money in your pocket, that gives you food. What if you didn't have money? What if Hashem stopped giving you money? I promise you that if you lived like I used to live, where you had to borrow one dollar every day in order for you to eat. Every day. You had to borrow one dollar so you could eat because you were too proud to collect charity on the street like a homeless person. You were too productive to not be working. You wanted to work, but you couldn't get a job or didn't want a job that pays you a salary. You wanted commission. You wanted to build a business. You wanted, you wanted, you wanted, so you, but you still needed money to eat. So you needed to borrow a dollar every single day so you could eat. 50 cents for a donut, 50 cents for coffee. I don't think you could do that anymore in today's America. But that's what it cost back then. And uh, I promise you, after you do that for enough time, a few months, for sure, you recognize that you need God in order for you to have food. So the difference is, again, and I can say it until tomorrow, and we still wouldn't be finished. We both do the same thing. You wake up, I wake up. You eat, I eat. You go to the bathroom, I go to the bathroom. You have a wife, I have a wife. You procreate, well, there's a, there's a mitzvah. You may not be fulfilling the mitzvah the right way, the ideal way, but every person that procreates, every person that raises children, Every person that eats, every person that uh, uh, um, uh, drinks, every person that uh, uh, wakes up. In fact, even taking a shower, even taking a shower is a form of a mitzvah, to be clean. So we both do the same thing. The difference is recognizing the source of all blessings, recognizing the source of all strength, recognizing the source of life before, during, and after you do everything you do. So we both do the same thing. The only difference between us is that I do my best to recognize the source of everything before, during, and after I do everything that I is that I do. And you don't. Because you think it's too hard to recognize that God gave you air. To recognize that God allowed your body to excrete without bleeding nonstop and ripping all of your tissues. You think it's too hard? I bet you it's not as hard as if any one of those body parts that you have and depend on stop working, even for a moment. Even for a moment. Even for a moment. That urethra shuts up. Shuts down, needs to be surgically opened. It's a tiny little hole. Tiny, tiny. Come on, look how many big holes. Look how big your mouth is. Ah, big mouth. Big, big mouth. So what's the big deal? If a tiny little hole, tiny, tiny, tiny hole, oh, that shuts off. Shuts off, doesn't open. You say open? No. Open? No. Open? No. How you can open? You got to break through. With knives, cannons. Now you're going to believe that you need God? You're going to believe you need God. You may even sing Free Palestine with me at that point. That song that we just came up with today, 
from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free from terrorism, from stupidity, from Islam that causes them to kill people. All that stuff. You know, we're going to sing that too. And we're all going to celebrate Ishtabach Shimcha La'ad. Thank you, Hashem, for allowing my body to work. Thank you. Thank you. And not just for being able to go to the bathroom. Can you imagine how many thank yous you owe a Kadosh Baruch Hu for eating, for drinking, for having money, for having kids, for having a wife, for having a husband, for having a job, for having just simply air. Air, air. You're saying it's hard? I'm saying it's ungrateful. Rabbi, you're amazing. I'm a big fan of you. I just really don't understand your issue with Rabbi Manus Friedman. Rabbi Manus Friedman is not a rabbi. He's an apikoros. He's a heretic. He's a rasha. He's a machti arabim. He's worse than Yerovam ben Nevat. And if you want to understand, then you can watch all of my lectures that I spoke against him, spoke about him, the lectures that Rabbi Ephraim spoke against him, spoke about him. These are the words of the Torah. These are the words of truth. And if you pay attention and your ears are open and your neshama is accepting the truth, then you will no longer misunderstand. Brother, why did the Vilna Gaon refuse to meet the Baal at Tanya and put Hasidut on Cherem? Because he had problems with Hasidut. He thought that they are turning the rabbis into God. trying to read the questions but you guys are asking too many things and it's hard to uh, read because the screen keeps popping uh, well, you're asking. somebody's mentioned something about penny stocks but I don't know what you're talking about How do I stop doing Zer Levetalam? My wife is on strike. If your wife is on strike, you have to check on what you did in order to deserve that strike. Why is your wife doing it? Uh, did you do something wrong? Did you cheat on her? Did you hit her? Did you yell at her? Did you curse her? Did you, what did you do to deserve her to be on strike? If you didn't do anything and she refuses to be with you, and this is not like a one-day thing, or one-week thing, or a one-month thing, but this is already months, then you have to give her a get, you have to get divorced. Uh, she's considered a isha muridit, a wayward wife. A wife is not allowed to withhold herself from her husband. It's a violation. And uh, if a wife that withhold, withhold herself from her husband, she's considered a isha muridit. Uh, the Rambam writes that uh, the rabbis warn her, after they warn her, they uh, shame her, and if she still doesn't do tshuva, eventually the husband gives her a get, kicks her out, and 
She doesn't get any of the ktuba. Uh, She's a isha moredet. When a family converts and has kids under 13 years old, do they get converted or they need to wait? They convert together with the parents. Uh, they're not usually asked the questions because uh, they, uh, they're too young. Uh, so the little kids, the boys dip with the father, the girls dip with the mother. Uh, if there's no father, then obviously the, uh, uh, the mother is, uh, dips with the little kids. Uh, but um, then they have to go back to the Bedin when they're uh, 13 years old for the boys and 12 years old for the girls, or in front of the, it uh, doesn't have to necessarily be at the Bedin, it just needs to be in front of the rabbis when they he, uh, reach that age to confirm that they want to remain Jewish. But they become Jewish already as little kids, already as infants. Can a Jewish soul in heaven visit a goyim soul in their heaven? Why would a Jewish soul want to visit a non-Jewish soul in heaven? I just, I just don't understand the, the logic behind this. Why would you? Why would a Jewish soul even think of of, of such a thing? Um, you perhaps because maybe you're connecting the uh, uh, this world to the next world. In the next world, you're not going to be connected to a lot of the things that you're connected to right now. Uh, you're not going to be connected to, to that. So, it's, uh, As far as where a soul can, can, do, can visit, it depends on its merits. Certain souls get permission to go do certain places. Certain souls get permission to do whatever they want. It depends. Uh, but I promise you that you're not going to want to go to the non-Jewish uh, heaven if you're in the Jewish heaven. Uh, Kolav, can you uh, clarify the blessing on mezonot products with cheese or fruit uh, like pie, cheesecake, danishes? But Katalyao talks about okay, so there is a uh, ikar vetafel. Ikar vetafel means that if the uh, majority, the, the, the main part of the food is the uh, mezonot, let's say for example, you have a uh, large cracker and a small piece of uh, I don't know, let's say some cheese in it. Uh, or you have a wafer, wafer with chocolate. Now, if you eat the wafer and the chocolate separately, it's two separate blessings. But since the wafer is the principal part, it's the ikal of the food, and the, uh, uh, the chocolate is the tafel, it's the, uh, it's the uh, subordinate food or the, uh, uh, the uh, um, minority food, uh, then making a blessing on the majority food covers both of them covers both of them. But if they are both majority, they're both significant. For example, if you have a, uh, a rice and a big piece of chicken, okay? Though they're both significant. So you make a blessing for the rice and you make a blessing for the chicken. Uh, now, but if, let's say, there is a uh, uh, rice, but there's also seasoning in there, you just make a blessing for the rice. There's rice and there is, let's say, a few vegetables in the rice. You only make a blessings for the rice. Because the rice is the uh, is the principal food, it's the principal food. Uh, so it all depends on the uh, uh, what's ikal and what's tefil. The second thing a person needs to know uh, is that uh, just because you make a first blessing doesn't mean that you make a second blessing on everything. Everybody thinks that if you eat a piece of cake, then you automatically are going to have to do a me'ain uh, shalosh. This is incorrect. Uh, this is incorrect. You don't make an ending blessing at all times uh, for mezonot. You have to meet the qualifications. You have to eat nearly 30 grams in four minutes in order for you to fulfill to, to do the blessing of me'ain shalosh. Meaning that if you're going to, let's say, eat, I don't know, a piece of cake, but the piece of cake is a, uh, only 10 grams or 15 grams or 20 grams, then you do the first blessing of mezonot, but you don't do an after blessing. Uh, or even if you eat an entire pie, okay, you make the blessing of mezonot, you eat an entire pie, but you eat it over five hours. Then you don't, unless you eat the, uh, the, those first 30 grams within four minutes, there's no 
uh, there's no after blessing. There's no after blessing. Uh, so that's, that's another thing. Uh, it's a, um, uh, there's a lot of details, a lot of nuances to blessings. It's not like a one-size-fits-all, but I can assure you that uh, most people uh, that don't learn the halachot and the details of blessings for sure are making mistakes, and it's important to learn them. It's not, it's not something that uh, you can learn one, two, three. There's some basics you can learn one, two, three. You know, what to bless is the first blessing for everything. Uh, you can learn that in a relatively short period of time, but uh, to know when to make the after blessing, uh, when to make only one blessing versus multiple blessings and so on, that uh, is not something that uh, uh, is uh, so simple. It's not so simple. I attend an event in a conservative. Can I attend an event in a conservative uh, synagogue? Uh, just like you're not allowed to uh, go to a church, uh, you're not allowed to go to a conservative synagogue. But if the conservative synagogue uh, has a hall that's separate from their where they uh, you know pray. They have, I don't know, a wedding hall. They have a, uh, you know, something like that. That's not where the, uh, they pray. Then you can go into that place. It's better you don't uh, if it's going to be a conservative type of party. But uh, if it's a, uh, you know, if it's a kosher party and, and, and it's not in their uh, pr place they pray, then uh, there's less of an issue in it. But if it's where they pray, you're not allowed to enter. My friend made Aliyah this summer. She said she wants a, to place her kids in Kippa Skula Yeshiva, not a very Haredi one. What does this mean? Uh, there's different uh, levels. Uh, there's different, I guess, uh, uh, levels of religiosity to a certain extent, differences between them. Uh, there are, some of them are more modern than the Haredi, but that's not in all cases. There are some Kippah Sulgad that are very, very righteous and very, very serious, uh, but they just, they relate more to the customs uh, of, uh, of that particular community. And then there are some uh, Haredi people that are, uh, claim to be Haredi, but they're uh, So just because someone is Haredi doesn't mean that they're, you know, or they're part of the Haredi community doesn't mean that they're automatically righteous. Some of them are righteous, some of them are not. Same thing with Kippah Sulgad. Some of them are righteous, some of them are not. Same thing with uh, you know anything else, even non-Jews. Uh, some of them are righteous, some of them are not. It's, uh, so we can't uh, stereotype that just because somebody wears a certain type of kippah, uh, that makes them righteous or that doesn't make them righteous. The key is whether they observe the Torah laws or not. If they observe the laws of the Torah, then they're righteous. If they ignore the laws of the Torah, they're wicked. Simple. I'm a tenth grade. I keep moving. What do I think about rabbis marrying gay people? That's not a rabbi. It's a heretic. Torah is forbids homosexuality. I'm a tenth grade high school student from India. So should I drop out and go to Eretz Yisrael to practice Judaism and continue education in Israeli public schools? Uh, you should never go to Israeli public schools or anybody who's got public school. Whether you should convert to Judaism or not, that depends on you know your, your life, your belief system, and in your age, your parents. Why did they get the, what are you saying? 
Why are they against that? Because the Torah is against it. Uh, that's great. Dragon cast out. I don't know what that means. Uh, can you explain more about how the Old Testament exposes the New Testament? I've done several lectures about uh, the falsehood of the New Testament, um, and there's many examples of it, same ones that I repeat many times. One of them is that it says in three places, no less than three places in the Old Testament, in the Torah, that Yaakov came down to Egypt with 70 souls. In the New Testament, it says 75. So obviously the New Testament is wrong. Um, and uh, the, uh, the, the, the location of Me'arat HaMachpelah, the cave of Me'arat is not only written in the Torah in multiple places, but it's something you can go see today. And in the New Testament, they have the wrong address. They have the wrong city. Uh, and many, many other types of examples. If you just type in the search of my channel, you go to the search box of the channel itself, or you go to our app, you type Christianity, or Jesus, or Yeshua, or New Testament, just type in those words, you'll see a bunch of different lectures that I've done with many other proofs that Christianity is falsehood and unfortunately is considered 100% idol worship, which means that all of those that follow the New Testament uh, are considered idol worshipers. And uh, we try to help them whenever, uh, whenever they come to us for, uh, and they want to uh, abandon idolatry and become either righteous Noahides or, con or convert to Judaism. We're more than happy to guide them in any way that we can for free. Um, many of them have actually uh, abandoned Christianity and uh, have become either righteous nor hide. Some of them have even uh, gone on to the conversion to Judaism path, and some have even succeeded in converting to Judaism uh, and living fantastic lives full of Torah, full of mitzvot. But some people uh, ignore the truth and continue living a lie. So, you know, you could try to help people, but you can't force them. Should a Haredim go to the IDF, to the army? Uh, it's better that the secular people go and to the yeshiva and to learn Torah uh, than, than the Haredim go to the army. Uh, is he allowed to go to the army? Yeah, he's allowed to do what he wants with his life. But should he go? No, he should go and learn Torah. Same thing like the secular person should also go and learn Torah. If everybody goes and learns Torah, we won't need an army. We won't need an army. Can people convert to Judaism? Yes. Not only they can convert to Judaism, but even my wife is a convert. And if you want to watch the story of how that happened, in that story, it's on my channel. The name of the film is called Hashem Took Back His Millions. Uh, it's a fantastic and inspirational story. Uh, and uh, also a big part of the reason of why I help many converts uh, that want to convert on their own. I don't convince anyone to convert. I simply tell people the truth. They choose for themselves. Do you pray to the dead rabbis? I don't pray to people. I pray to God. But the merits of the righteous rabbis and sages of Judaism are certainly people and, and souls that you want to connect to by learning their Torah. Uh, and if you're at a level where you could even, uh, you know, pray that they uh, use their merits to, to, to pray for you, to help you, sure. But we only pray to God. We don't pray to people. Not living or dead. Why are you ignoring Nida 44, 9 to 12? I have no idea what you're talking about, but um, perhaps you could elaborate.
Can anyone do a Brit Mila or does it have to be a rabbi? Uh, it has to be a Jew. And it has to be someone that is a, uh, knows the laws of how to do a Brit Mila. It can't just uh, cut whatever they deem fit. There are certain things that have to take place as far as the Brit Mila. They don't necessarily need to be a rabbi of a community, but they have to be a certified mohel, certified mohel that learned the laws uh, and the details of how to do brit milah, has training by uh, by some by an expert and not just simply a doctor. Uh, if you got a circumcision by a doctor, uh, then uh, many times the circumcision does not follow all the laws of Judaism, which require a second surgery because they don't take off certain parts. And sometimes when they do, if somebody did this, they would still have to do what's called atafat adam uh, in order to convert, which is they would prick the male member uh, in order to generate uh, some blood. Uh, and uh, that's uh, for, 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 the, for that uh, sake. They won't have to do circumcision because there's nothing to cut, but uh, there's still atafat adam. But if you are in the process of converting, uh, don't uh, do a circumcision on your own. Uh, uh, only do it once the rabbis tell you, the Bedin tells you to do it, because if you do it on your own, it's very possible that the Bedin will not want to convert you ever, uh, because they'll take you uh, as uh, somebody that's rebellious. Shouldn't we have a Haredi division in the army who learns to lie as soldiers? Yes, we do. We have. They're in the yeshivot. Why do they have to be in a, in a, in a, uh, in a desert? They're in yeshivot, of course. A thousand, a thousand. Elef lamane, elef lamane. That's what Moshe Rabbeinu says. Sure. Alvai, we had as many people learning in yeshivot as we do soldiers. Uh, Alvai, I wish we had as many people learning in Torah as we do soldiers. But we have a lot more people that are soldiers than we have people in yeshivot. What's your opinion of Yeshiva University? It's more university than Yeshiva. What to do if you're artificial? If you're artificial insemination, mother was adopted, have no family history, but you have Jewish traits. I have no idea what you're saying. I'm sorry. That's just simply too convoluted of a question to ask publicly I would have to know more privately what you're talking about I'm a new convert learned so much from you thank you rabbi very good my wife and I enjoy your channel Shalom Aleichem if somebody experiences any type of bleeding on Shabbat or otherwise, they should clean themselves. And uh, if it's uncontrollable, call 911. Go to the hospital. All right, I started chemotherapy. The doctor recommended I go to a sperm bank as a precaution since I don't have children yet. Is this considered wasting seed? Yes. Not allowed. Is Jews going to grave sites of righteous people considered idol worship? It depends. If they're praying to the person, uh, then yes. If they're praying to God, then no. Called Rabbi for one. What? I don't know. I don't worship her. Is Tinder allowed? I don't know what Tinder is. You had mentioned that there weren't women warriors in half a shekel of ten. You mentioned that there wasn't women warriors 
in half a shekel. Counting it in Devora, Batis with battles with Knan, there was one. What's the view on that? Devora wasn't a warrior, so I'm not really sure what cartoon you watched to make you think that Devora was a warrior, but she wasn't a warrior. She was a prophet, but she wasn't a warrior. It's two different things. Can Jews use Tinder? I don't know what Tinder is. Tinder is a dating app. If it's a kosher dating app, yes. If it's not a kosher dating app, no. What do you think about... Ugh. What do you think about Rabbi Solomon who owns Pornhub? How can he still pretend to be a rabbi? I already spoke about him. There's a clip about him that we made. He's a rasha. He's not a rabbi. He's going to go to Gainom and not come out. Um... Uh, who's more close to the term of Bnei Noach, Islam or Christian? Uh, well, Islam, you know, is a, uh, most opinions are that it's not idolatry. Um, so they're not idol worshippers, according to most opinions. There are some opinions, like the, Rog uh, the Rogachev uh the, um, um, Klosenberger Rebbe and some other Chachamim say that Islam is idolatry. Either way, uh, most don't pass in that way. So they're not idol worshippers. They're wicked. Uh, you know, when they follow the details of the Quran that talked about anti-Semitism and hatred of Jews. But it's not idolatry. Uh, therefore, you're allowed to go in, a Jew is allowed to enter a mosque. Um, Christianity, on the other hand, is considered idolatry. Uh, because they pray to a person, they say that God is three, uh, the virgin birth, there's multiple uh, parts of it that are full of idolatry, so therefore a Jew is never allowed to go and enter a church. So in both cases, you know, you have uh, major issues. Uh, now, currently, there is more, uh, you know, war with physical war between the Jews and, the, uh, and Islam, uh, but that's not, that wasn't always the case. You know, if you look at the track record, uh, the Christians have caused much more damage and killed many more Jews uh, than the Muslims did. And I'm not just talking about the Holocaust. Uh, you could just go back a few hundred years and look at what the Crusaders did to the Jews. Literally, they would go to town and literally annihilate an entire Jewish town. In one day, they would kill everybody. They wouldn't even uh, turn them into anything. Uh, they would literally just chop off their heads, kill them in horrific ways, one after another. Uh, and this is, anybody you know, learns a little history, what the uh, Crusaders did to us in the name of uh, Christianity is uh, uh, you know, much, much worse than what happened on October th uh, 7th in Israel recently. Much worse. They used to literally go from town to town and kill everybody. 6,000, 7,000, 5,000, 10,000, you know, big and small towns. They would just literally kill everyone. They killed many Chachamim too. Uh, there was a lot of massacres about 400 years ago also. So does that mean that all Christians today are bad as far as enemies of, of, of the Jews in that sense? No. Some are, some aren't. Does that mean that all uh, people that are Muslim are enemies of the Jews? No. Some people are decent, some people are bad. So as far as the people themselves, it's, you know, again, it's a, they don't necessarily always uh, follow the bad teachings that uh, is stated in their book. There are many anti-Semitic teachings in Christianity as well as in Islam. Uh, but uh, at the same token, the, uh, not everyone that calls himself a Christian uh, or everyone that calls themselves a Muslim follows all of those teachings. Does that mean that we could uh, be best friends and uh, marry each other's kids? Absolutely not. No. The Jews will always be the Jews, and uh, you know the others will be the others. As far as who's closest to being a Noahide, whoever makes themselves closest to abandoning their false beliefs is closest. Uh, because the reason why, you know, it's not so simple to just say that Islam is closest to be Noahides uh, than uh, Christianity is because it's much easier 
for a Christian to abandon the idolatry of Christianity and join Judaism than it is for a typical Muslim to abandon Islam and uh, go to Judaism uh, throughout history and right now. It's much, much easier uh, ideologically, uh, socially, it's much easier for them. I have some students that are used to be Christian and now are Jews and used to be Muslims and now are Jews. I have both. But if you compare the two, and anyone that deals with converts will tell you the same. The, uh, the amount of uh, Christ former Christians that convert to Judaism um, uh, or just abandon Christianity, become righteous Noahites, uh, versus the amount of Muslims that abandon Islam and convert to Judaism. Um, I don't really know of any of them that become righteous Noahites, to be honest with you. Most of them either convert to Judaism or they stay Muslim. Uh, just try to be decent. Uh, but the amount, there's much more on the, uh, on the former Christian side. Uh, so as far as, uh, you know, uh, the, the way that you could explain that is that it's a... Uh, um, it's not just the belief in, uh, in the book that makes up the decisions of what the people are going to do. There's, there's also the culture, there's also the personal experiences that the people had, uh, there's also the risks. There is much more risk for uh, the life uh, of a Muslim to convert to Judaism than the risk for a Christian to convert to Judaism. Meaning that most Christians in the world... If they decide to abandon Christianity and uh, become uh, become Jews, uh, you know, generally speaking, uh, their you know their life is not going to be at risk. More times than not, their families will still accept them, and uh, even sometimes be more welcoming. Some will reject them. Some will uh, not talk to them. But that's a minority. The majority will continue talking to their kids, they'll continue talking to each other, they'll have somewhat of an amicable relationship. Of course, the belief systems have changed, but nonetheless, you can maintain, uh, you can maintain those relationships. In Islam, on the other hand, more times than not, for a Muslim to uh, leave uh, Islam and become a Jew, uh, it's a life risk, meaning that they risk somebody in their family killing them. Why? Because that's part of the belief system. It's part of the culture. Um, I have a couple of times where I've had students that had to uh, that wanted to convert to Judaism. Part of their uh, conversion was literally fleeing uh, their families, their friends, and like disconnecting, like they were uh, you know escaping a jail. Like they can't talk, they can't you know commun They have to completely disconnect altogether, never talk again. Why? Because they know that the second that their families find out where they are, they'll probably kill them. And I've even had one time that uh, one of the people, actually their family somehow found out where they were and they almost killed them. So it's not, it's not, it's not so simple. It's not so simple. So it's the culture, it's the belief system. It's, it, there's a lot of things, a lot of uh, uh, issues. I want to start reading the holy book of the Jewish. Uh, start with the uh, Chumash, or it's called the Five Books of Moses. Uh, that and st with the commentary uh, which explains to you what's actually written by Rashi. I suggest you go to a website called Art Scroll, artscroll.com, and uh, type in either Five Books of Moses or uh, or Chumash, which is C H U M A S H, and you'll see over there the uh, stone uh, a stone edition Chumash. And that's the five books of Moses with some basic level commentary to explain to you what the verses actually mean. And you can go through that and start understanding uh, some of the parts of the Torah and grow from there. And then, of course, continue watching lectures, continue uh, understanding the uh, many, many other details beyond uh, what you're reading. Uh, okay, Rabotai, it's been uh, amazing. And I uh, enjoyed it, but uh, it's time to go. Time to go, even though there's Bo Hashem, many of you watching online right now. Uh, I need to finish a few things that, uh, unfortunately, the clock is ticking on them for the organization, and um, I need to utilize the time. But uh, I'm glad that we were able to learn for a couple of hours. Anyone that enjoyed this and wants to watch more, you could simply go to our 
YouTube page or our Be'ezrat Hashem phone app uh, or our website bhtorah.org and just type in or just go to those sites and you'll see a bunch of lectures thousands of them Baruch Hashem short ones long ones and you can watch many of them if you like this type of style then type in Stump the Rabbi there's a whole series almost 200 videos uh, so there's enough for you to watch uh, not only until the next time we learn together but uh, for many many more times and if you uh, want to help us continue doing all the wonderful things that we're doing you could donate on any one of those places and in the websites on YouTube uh, you could uh, become one of these paid subscribers that's really a donation uh, on Facebook on the app so many words there's plenty of ways for you to donate and last but not least for the Jewish people especially the mitzvot of, of, uh, of Purim start now there's the machatzita shekel uh, and there's also the matanot lehev yonim uh, you could do both of them on our campaign page bhpurim.org we use all of that money to feed poor people uh, in Eretz Yisrael that are also going to be praying and learning Torah for us uh, so you get a uh, double uh, double uh, uh, benefit out of uh, donating to that donating to that campaign and Bezot Hashem we will succeed thank you very much for learning with me bless each and every single one of you that's learning that's getting closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that wants to do the will of Hashem and is doing their best to get there and Bezot Hashem we will continue learning again next week more stuff more Torah more opportunities to learn to enjoy and most importantly to be holy Bachavatz Lacha and Shabbat Shalom. Holkanos asked him, what can we do to protect ourselves from Chavre Mashiach? He says, Torah and Gmilut Chasadim. Even if somebody does a, a nice thing or learns a lot or anything like that, it's never compared to bringing one of Hashem's lost kids that's been lost for the last 3,000 years back home. One of the beautiful things that we have in our organization is that we have both Torah and Zikri Rabin because we have our Kolels, we have our Avrachim, and we also have our cube that we do around the world. Our lectures reach every corner of the world, Baruch Hashem, in multiple languages, but of course, we always want to do even more. כל שעכשיו אנחנו נשמע את השופעה של המשיח נמצא איתנו כאן האורח מפלורידה יושב ראש הארגון מזכה הרבים הרב ירון ראובן בעזרת השם כולנו נעשה ונצליח ונגדל בתורה ונזכה את הרבים ונעשה כבוד שמיים כמו שצריך אבתם המלאה תורה תמשיכו תהיו אור גדול שמה ישראל אדוני אלוהים אדוני בהזדמנות אני אברך את הרב ירון רובן שהוא מזכה את הרבים ומחזיק תורה בעם ישראל בארץ וגם בתפוצות אשרי אמר שלך לקרוא שימשיך עוד לעשות כאלה וכאלה זכות גדולה מאוד שהוא מחזיק תורה בעם ישראל טוב שסים נוספו הערב לעם ישראל לכבודה של תורה להרמת קרנה של תורה וכל הדברים הללו ברוך השם הודות לידידנו יושב ראש הארגון שעוד לא ידע את ההפתעה שתכננתי לו while we have cure work that we've done throughout the whole year, we also have the Torah that we're constantly producing more and more of, and last but not least, the uh, chesed to feed the poor people in Israel. A very special thank you to all our amazing guests who show real about this land by taking the time out of their busy schedule and sharing their ups and downs with us, all for the sake of our land. Yirgun Be'ezrat Hashem, Olech Lechalek, Me'ot Saleh Mazon, 
בכל רחבי הארץ. One of the big things that we have, aside from this campaign, you probably see this post or something similar to it, is also we published some of the recent results that we have, or at least up to now, of the organization. And one of the reasons why we do this each year is because we want to make sure that our partners, our donors, our Talmidin, know where their money is going. Unlike everybody else that, you know, uh, says a lot, does a lot, we want to show you what these results are. I can tell you from my experience and a little bit of knowledge about the whole Torah world, I don't know of anybody else, uh, any other organization on planet Earth that produces dollar for dollar what we produce over these last few years. This is nothing to be arrogant about. It's simply Siyat Bishmaya Kadosh Baruch who helped us. We made every sacrifice that we can possibly make in order to, to make it happen. Producing nearly 300 films, publishing 32 books, our own books, giving out 154,000 books for free. Giving out 154,000 books is not a cheap endeavor. Anyone that wants to do such a thing has to be completely committed to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, to his children, and most importantly, to have bitachon in HaKadosh Baruch Hu and his Torah. We also have fed over 160 thousand people over these last several years each year during Pesach the high holidays throughout the year we help a lot of people eat help make sure that they have groceries food all types of things and uh, you guys have seen many of the videos that are uh, that we've produced over the years to actually show you the people that are getting this food you have here 160,000 people have eaten nearly 300 Torah films and then on top of all of it, we have 1.4 million USB CDs and cards that have been given out for free. All of the work that we've done over the last 10 years on these USBs given out for free. Last but not least, 12,000 video and audio lectures available online in about 14 different languages for the world to watch for free. <laughs> ארגון בעזרת השם לקח על עצמו את אחת המטרות הקשות ביותר בדור שלנו לתקן עולם במלכות שדי לא להסתפק במשהו אחד לעזור רק לאנשים מסכנים רק לאנשים ניצולי שואה רק לאנשים שלא מכירים את אלוקים רק לאנשים שאין להם כלום בבית אלא לעזור לכלל ישראל בכל מכל ברוך השם, חפץ השם בידינו הצליח למעלה ממיליון יהודים ויהודיות נעזרו על ידי ארגונים בעזרת השם. רק תדמיינו לכם איזה עוצמה היה לכל אחד ואחת מהשותפים שזכו להיות כל אחד כפי כוחו ויכולתו, לאיזה תוצאות הצליחו להגיע ולאיזה תוצאות עוד יצליחו. ברפור הוא שמח על לראות את השלטים, נעלה עכשיו למעלה, כמו קצת האש, את הלימוד. ברוכים הבאים, אפשר לראות כאן. כולם יושבים לומדים, איזה רעש של תורה, איזה רעש, איזה רעש, והנה יש פה עוד בית מדרש. וגם פה יש, השם הכל עמוס. הדמיון הזה הוא לא דמיון כל כך רחוק, כי כמו שהתורה אומרת, בפיך ובלבבך לעשותו, ככה גם בדבר הזה. כל מי שירצה, כל מי שרוצה או רוצה להיות שותפים איתנו, עם הארגון הקדוש והנפלא הזה, שכל כוונתו לשם שמיים, להגדיל תורה ולהדירה, להרים קרן התורה, לעזור לכל אחד ואחד מעם ישראל, בכל העניינים. כל המישורים, מי הילד הכי קטן שצריך מטרנה וטיטולים עד האיש הכי 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 מבוגר שלעולם לא הניח תפילין ורגע לפני המוות דואגים להניח לו תפילין. אם גם אתם רוצים להיות שותפים בכאלה דברים גדולים בעשייה של תורה ועבודה בגנים חסדים, ברוך השם, ארגון בעזרת השם כאן לצדכם, לשירותכם, יחד עם כלל ישראל. כמעט מיליון וחצי דיסקים, דיסקונקים שחילקנו, כל הדברים האלה בחינם, יותר מ-12 אלף שיעורים, אז כל הדברים האלה, מתי שבן אדם רואה כמה ההשקעה שלו, אם זה בבתים, מניות, בכל מיני דברים, והוא רואה שהמניה עלתה 10% במקום אחד, ו-1,000% במקום שני, אז הוא מבין איפה להשקיע פעם הבאה. ואותו דבר פה, יש הרבה אנשים שברוך השם צופים את השיעורים שלנו, שיעורים של הרב אפרים, שיעורים של הרב שרביט, ושאר הרבנים בארגון, ועכשיו זה הזמן להיות שותפים בדבר הגדול שאנחנו עושים ברוך השם. One of the reasons why we do this, why we show these numbers, is because we want to show everyone what we've done to give you an indication. an indication of what we can do in the future. So this is the time where we need as much of your help as possible to push yourself 
more than you typically do. If you typically donate a couple hundred dollars, donate a thousand. If you, uh, if you can afford uh, the uh, uh, 8,000, 15,000, 50,000, whatever you could afford, this is the time to do it because this is going to be the help that we have to help all of these avachim, to feed these people and perhaps Bezal Hashem one day to get that building that we've been uh, wanting to, uh, to build here in, uh, in the United States to build a community. But the, all of these things require millions of dollars. If not now, then when?